Hello, and welcome back to this Schiller Institute International Conference. This is panel two in the afternoon on Saturday. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find a link to the conference webpage in the video description. My name is Jason Ross. I am a many-year collaborator with Lyndon LaRouche and the lead co-author on the Schiller Institute's recent draft program on addressing the COVID-19 pandemic entitled LaRouche's Apollo Mission to Defeat the Global Pandemic, Build a World Health System Now. This panel will be a real treat. We are going to be bringing together astronauts, astrophysicists, and other top scientists as well as a physician to gain a deeper insight into the role of science and the advancement of the human species and a deeper idea about the essence of what science itself actually is. After the presentations and perhaps during them, there will be time for discussion. You can participate in that discussion. You can do so by sending your questions or brief thoughts to us at questions at schillerinstitute.org questions at schillerinstitute.org. We will definitely not be able to address every question that comes our way. We have received, you know, I think 50 or so so far um, this morning. So apologies if we're not able to get to your question. We will be forwarding them to speakers afterwards so that they can respond if they'd like to. So if your question is directed towards a particular one of the panelists, please indicate that in your question. So we will begin with the discussion of the global health system that Helga Tsepp-LaRouche had brought up in her keynote, considered from the broadest possible perspective, the strategic defense of the human species. The speakers for this first presentation will be Ben Denniston, Megan Beats, and myself. Here we have, uh, good, looks like we have our speakers here. We're also seeing Michelle Tonini, who will be uh, speaking um, after that. So, uh, Ben, Megan, and I, we titled our talk In Defense of the Human Species. At present, the planet is being plagued by a tiny piece of RNA, just 30,000 base pairs long, that's causing pandemonium, keeping us hostage in our homes, just this tiny bit of RNA in a drop of oil with some protein sticking out. With all of the uncertainty that there has been around this disease, about how to treat it, how to prevent it, what measures are appropriate, what measures aren't, controversy about masks, there's a lot of ideas going around that aren't correct, and we'll discover that in due time. But let's talk about not just the missed opportunities to prevent this disease in particular, but what about the missed opportunities not to more quickly start producing masks, but what have we done over the past decades that have left us susceptible to a world in which we are held hostage by a virus? Over 50 years ago, human beings left the Earth and set foot on the moon, forever expanding the horizon of the possible. 75 years ago, the atom yielded to scientific thought offering a bounty of energy many orders of magnitude greater than what could be provided by molecular or chemical means, such as coal, oil, gas, and definitely beyond what could be provided by physical means, such as wind mills or water wheels. Over a hundred years ago, human minds became aware of the existence of a new, astonishing world of quantum phenomena and began to forge ideas to comprehend and make use of this new domain, as well as the realization that what we thought were space and time, energy and matter, were not distinct categories, but had a connection between them that was previously unknown. Over 400 years ago, Johannes Kepler created modern physical science through his faith in the power of human ideas to comprehend the causes of nature. Stepping beyond appearances, he hypothesized for the first time what made the planets move. So how could such a species be held hostage by a virus? For that, we have to examine not the great successes of science, including those just mentioned, but the failures of science and of culture more generally that have allowed us to be prey to false and ugly axioms of thought that have plagued us for millennia. 
the most crucial concepts that we have as human beings are those respecting our humanity, what we are as a human species, what we are capable of, and what our relationship to nature is. Consider two contrasting outlooks of the human species. On the one side, there is the view that the human mind is made in the image of God and therefore coheres with creation in such a way that our ideas have the power of physical forces to unlock ever-improving knowledge of the world around us, or the idea that the human mind does not really exist. Free will is a delusion, as our brains, being biochemical in nature, are governed by the laws of physics, which we will one day be able to explain, at least in potential, be able to use to be explained to, excuse me, we'll be able to explain our thoughts and decisions. Human thought can be replicated by a mechanical system. True artificial intelligence is possible. One view says that human beings are a remarkable species. Unlike any other form of life, we can improve our living from generation to generation, incre increasing in number and in quality. We can improve nature beyond the state that it happens to have at the present. On the other view, some people say that humanity is a horrible species, that what sets us apart from all other life is that we destroy ecosystems, drive species to extinction, and destroy the planet with our excessive numbers. We must end growth and return to nature, according to these people. One view holds that we create resources by the power of our mind, whereby uranium, which was just a rock, becomes a useful fuel by the fact that we have learned how to unlock its atomic, its nuclear potential. On the other side is the view that we are consumers of resources, that we gorge ourselves in a relentless pursuit of material comfort. One view is that humanity is the most beautiful species, that the world needs more people. The other view is that humanity is the worst species and that the world should have fewer people. Most of us have varieties of both types of these thought echoing in our minds to some degree. Lyndon LaRouche and the Schiller Institute maintain the first outlook of growing creativity and beauty, of growing humanity, that this is true in science, in culture, and in art. Recognizing the conflict between these two paradigms, Lyndon LaRouche saw the coronavirus coming, not in its particulars, but as a potential, and he said what to do about it. The Schiller Institute saw this coming in potential, and we said what to do about it. Today we have the coronavirus on our minds, but we are susceptible every day to a variety of horrors against which we and the Earth have no current defense. Other viruses, the dangerous drawdown of groundwater, a comet striking our planet, the sun throwing off a coronal mass ejection and destroying half of our planet's power grid, or even the simple task seemingly simple in some of the developed countries, of having clean water and proper sanitation for the over two billion of our fellow human beings who lack reliable access to improved water and sanitation. Or insects, consider the plague of locusts currently spreading. In the immediate sense, we need a global health system, a response to the COVID pandemic, but we need much more. We must go beyond a group of medical experts with a few technicians that can be sent around the world. We need the resources, the commitment, and the intention to ensuring that around the world we have the global economic infrastructure required to support a robust health infrastructure. Talking about hand washing where there is no running water is a cruel joke. Talking about telling people to stay at home when they rely on their daily work to earn, to pay for their daily bread, this simply doesn't function. How do we address the fact that the world is in this condition? We have put forward a preliminary proposal on how to do this. It is posted on the Schiller Institute site, and you can find it by searching for its title, which you see on the screen, LaRouche's Apollo Mission to Defeat the Global Pandemic, Build a World Health System Now. But Let's now seem to leave behind our worldly cares. Let's reflect on our fundamental beliefs about the human species 
and let's do it from the standpoint of the heavens, full both of promise and of peril. And let's look down on ourselves from that standpoint to get the broadest sense of what would be a strategic defense of the earth, a strategic defense of the human species. Thanks, Jason. Uh, the term strategic defense of earth specifically was first floated in the Russian press in 2011, if people are not familiar with it. And it was absolutely a direct reference to the Strategic Defense Initiative, the SDI, which was the Reagan era proposal for a joint missile defense system between the US and the USSR to end the threat of mutually assured destruction, MAD. Now, for many people around the world, Lyndon LaRouche is perhaps most, famous, most famously known for his leading role in promoting his notion of the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, and also his key position as a back channel between the US government and the Soviet government at the time. However, while that is somewhat known, and Mr. LaRouche is somewhat famous for that, not everyone shared the same idea for how the SDI was supposed to be implemented. So it is critical for us to emphasize Mr. LaRouche's unique conception for his SDI program and illustrate how this core principle is as valid today with the strategic defense of Earth as it was in the 1980s. This policy is derived from a scientific principle, a scientific assessment expressing the current stage of the long-term development of the human species. S Mr. LaRouche's SDI policy was not merely about defense against uh, defensive systems to prevent thermonuclear war. It was also about establishing the necessary political and economic policies to ensure lasting, stable peace, to ensure durable survival generations into the future. And there's probably nothing better than to let Mr. LaRouche state this in his own words. So we have a brief couple minute clip from an address Mr. LaRouche gave in September of the year 2000, 20 years ago now, to a Schiller Institute conference at the time. The policy, this is the policy which became known as Strategic Defense Initiative. Now, the important thing is to understand what the original SDI was, contrary to the idiocy which you hear in the press today about missile defense, which what you hear in the press is idiocy by people who are worse than idiots. And they don't know anything about missile defense. So what we have to do is something completely different. We do have the ability to devise systems, new kinds of physical systems, which could deal effectively with thermonuclear missiles, that is, render them effectively, technologically obsolete down the line. But that was not the extent of my proposal. The proposal was that instead of having the Soviet Union and the United States engaged in this crazy chicken game called SALT-1 and ABM, why don't we find a way out of the conflict itself? How? Because the Soviet economy, like the U.S. economy, is collapsing. The present policies of the U.S. economy, the present policies of the Soviet economy, ensure a collapse of those economies, physical collapse. So why don't we change the policy? Why don't we go back to the space program, program of Kennedy? And let's do what we proved with, with Kennedy. Remember, according to the estimates which were made in the middle of the 1970s, the United States got more than a dime of additional GNP out of every penny the United States invested in the space program, the Kennedy Space Program. The point is that since increases in productivity come directly only from improvements in technology derived from fundamental scientific discoveries, the higher the rate you convert fundamental physical discoveries into practice, the greater the rate of increase of, pro of productivity per capita of population and per square kilometer of area. The problem of both the Soviet system and our own 
though in different degrees, I said at the time, was that the United States was not generating a rate of net growth in physical productivity sufficient to maintain the economy. Therefore, we needed a program for forced draft, science-driven, technological progress with some mission, like the moon mission, but as a byproduct of that mission, such as the moon mission, we would generate spillovers in terms of technological progress by such a crash program to put the United States economy back on the plus side in terms of net growth. The Soviet economy does not work for similar reasons, different but similar reasons. Therefore, if the Soviet Union, with its vast uh, military scientific technological capability, were to put that capability in cooperation with us in global technological progress. And if we focused upon developing countries, South America, Africa, Asia, to do what Roosevelt proposed be done for these countries had he not died, then the benefit of such a program would put the two things. We put the two economies back on the plus side together with Europe and it would also be a way of creating a global agenda which would solve the conflict problem. Now that was the SDI, the original form. So obviously today we no longer have a conflict between the USSR, the Soviet Union and the United States, but as we've been discussing in this conference, other geop geopolitical tensions have clearly emerged. And LaRouche's core policy, his SDI policy, is just as valid and necessary today. As Jason discussed in, in his opening, mankind has seen tremendous growth over the past few hundred years. And that is a relatively minuscule amount of time compared to the history of our planet, our solar system, the biosphere, our galaxy, and so on very short period of time. And only in the past hundred years, mankind has really entered into a new historical phase in which the same technological capabilities, the same scientific discoveries, which have brought tremendous growth, tremendous progress, have also created a new historical situation in which mankind now technologically has the capability to annihilate itself through war and conflict. Mankind can no longer allow not just full-scale military conflict between nations like we've seen before, but we can no longer tolerate the political and economic preconditions which lead to those conflicts, as LaRouche outlined. So a historical change is needed, as Helga Zepp LaRouche has led the discussion in, in, in raising the need for the shift to a new paradigm, as she has defined it. But this relatively new historical period mankind finds himself in, defined by this new capability, comes with another more profound aspect. What do we really know about life on this planet, in our galaxy, in this universe? Well, we can know one thing for certain. The vast majority of all forms of species of animal life that have existed on this planet are no longer here. Estimates are that over 99% of all species of animal life that have emerged on this planet through the evolutionary record have gone extinct. Over 5 billion species gone. And interestingly, we have evidence that this is not this extinction process, this evolutionary process is not simply a planetary process or even a solar system process but somehow involves our galaxy as well. 500 million years of records of species origination and extinction uh, exhibit a cyclical pattern that matches our periodic changing relation to our galaxy. Very interesting studies pointing at this, indicating that somehow the evolution of life on Earth is actually somehow also expressing some galactic influence or is expressing some form of galactic process. So this extinction principle is an undeniable fact of the evolutionary development of the biosphere. 
And under that principle alone, with no other intervening factors, you can guarantee that all currently existing species of animal life on the planet today are also going to go extinct at some point in the future as the evolutionary process continues. The only, there's only one exception, scientific exception that we know of, one distinction, one form of life that expresses anything distinct from and transcending this principle of the biosphere. And that is the existence of mankind uniquely expressing the distinct power of creativity as Lyndon LaRouche has uniquely defined a scientific understanding of human creativity. And this is not seen in any form of animal life. So the same science and technologies, which gives us the ability to destroy ourselves in conflict, the potential to wipe out our entire species on this planet, also provides the ability for mankind to be the only species on this planet which transcends and moves beyond the limits of the biosphere, which defeats the extinction principle. As Mr. LaRouche used to often say, mankind is the only potentially immortal species if he chooses to fulfill that destiny. So in the spirit of the SDI, LaRouche's SDI, years later, decades later, we're still discussing the evolution of that same core policy, now in the form of the strategic defense of Earth. A policy to erode the economic and political causes underlying conflict through joint science driver and technology sharing programs focused on addressing the common threats facing all mankind. So just as the SDI was designed to unite the leading powers of the planet against the common threat of thermonuclear missiles, the strategic defense of Earth is intended to unite mankind against the common threats which all inhabitants of this planet inherently face. From space weather to asteroid strikes, from cosmic driven climate change to comet impacts, from pandemics to catastrophic earthquakes and volcanism, mankind is unavoidably united in dealing with these dangers inherent to living on this small planet subject to the influences of our solar system and our galaxy beyond. So I'd like to pick up from here and I'd like to begin by talking for a little bit about the weather. We tend to think of weather, including dangerous extreme weather events, as local phenomena. For a bit more astute, we realize that, no, no, the weather is actually a planetary phenomenon, with weather events on one part of the planet affecting those on the other. But in reality, there is nothing simply local or even planetary about the weather. Our Earth and the other planets in the solar system swim in an environment created by the sun. One feature of that environment is the solar wind, which is a constant flux of charged particles streaming out from the sun, which creates the interplanetary magnetic field and modulates Earth's magnetic field. Now, why is this important? Because the sun is a dynamic body. It's changing, and we are mere babies in our understanding of it. For example, approximately every 11 years, the sun goes through a cycle of increasing and decreasing activity, during which the polarity of the sun's magnetic field completely flips. We track this solar cycle by the number and the polarity of sunspots, which if we pull up the first slide, you can see as the dark areas on the sun's surface, which are sites of intense magnetic activity. If we go to the next slide, we see a chart of the number of sunspots over time, going back to the early 1600s when they were first observed showing a clear 11 year cycle of maximum and minimum. However, not every solar cycle is the same. And there are longer period cycles of very low lows called grand minima, 
in which almost no sunspots appear for a long time. And there are periods of very high highs, periods of grand maxima. Now, what I want to talk about here for a moment is I want to talk about the periods of solar maximum, when the sun is its most active. Two space weather phenomena which occur as part of this intense activity of the sun are solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Oops, we can go to the next slide. This is just this slide is just another um, indication of the solar cycle using the proxy of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. If we go to the next slide, we see on the left here an image of a solar flare from NASA's SDO satellite. And on the right, you see um, a coronal mass ejection. So solar flares are intense flashes of energy occurring on the sun's surface, which release bursts of electromagnetic radiation. Coronal mass ejections, also called CMEs, are often associated with solar flares, and they, uh, as opposed to the flares, they fling large clouds of plasma, charged particles, out into space, some of which are directed at the Earth. Now, while solar flares and the energy from them can disrupt radio communications in, on and near the Earth, CMEs are something much more dangerous. When a CME strikes the Earth, it can induce an oscillation in the Earth's magnetic field, causing a geomagnetic storm. These storms can be mild, and they create the auroras, which are lovely, but they can also be severe. And if they're severe, they have the potential to induce currents in electrical infrastructure. They can blow out the transformers, causing blackouts in the electrical grid of an entire hemisphere of the Earth, which receives the CME strike. With our current capabilities, we would not have the, cap the ability to repair that for several months, possibly years. In 1859, a large CME struck the Earth called the Carrington event, and there were reports of auroras visible near the equator. There are reports of telegraph systems catching on fire, blowing out, glowing with induced current, even though they weren't hooked up. If a CME of that magnitude struck the Earth today, we could expect sweeping and long-lasting blackouts for which we are not prepared. Another effect of CMEs are phenomena called forebush decreases. This is when intense magnetic activity from the sun temporarily blocks the normal influx of cosmic rays from the galaxy. So if we look at the slide here, we see two sudden drops in cosmic ray flux, uh, labeled there as the Forbush decreases, as the result of two geomagnetic storms, which you see in the red there on the top. These occurred in March of 2011. Now, initial studies that were done indicate that the resulting change in the ionization of the atmosphere and the change in associated latent heat release can, in turn, increase the temperature differential with the ground. This can affect convection currents and potentially increase and intensify cyclones. This is believed to have happened in the case of Hurricane Katrina. Now, the phenomenon of the atmospheric ionization caused by increased galactic cosmic ray flux has been studied and demonstrated to create an increase in cloud cover on the Earth. The galaxy increasing and modulating cloud cover on the Earth. Now, <clears throat> this is a major factor in cycles of global temperature. And in fact, there's a very interesting correlation between the 140 million year cycle of our Earth's transit in and out of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy, which are regions of relatively high cosmic ray flux. There's a correlation between that cycle 
and the long-term cycles of warming and cooling of the planet, which you see in the slide here, indicated as the ice house earth periods. So not only is the sun acting to control our planet's weather, but now we have to ask the question, what is in turn modulating the activity of the sun? What is occurring in the galactic environment in which our sun swims? So following on that, on the thread of these unique threats that uh, all inhabitants of this planet face, another existential threat uh, for which we currently have no defense is the inevitability of future asteroid and comet impacts. Uh, much of the world was given a rather rude and surprising awakening to this reality in 2013. I think many of you probably have seen this footage and remember it. Uh, with the surprise explosion of a very small asteroid in the atmosphere above Chelyabinsk, Russia. Now, no one knew this small asteroid was on a collision course with the Earth because, uh, prior to its impact, because we've only been able to locate uh, and track a relatively small percentage of the asteroids that are in the inner solar system environment. Um, significant efforts have been made to track uh, most of the larger asteroids. Um, but there are literally hundreds of thousands of unidentified, untracked, medium and smaller sized asteroids that are out there by all current estimates. And these are asteroids that are larger than the one that exploded over Russia, which we just saw, which could devastate an area on the smaller end around the size of a city or in the more medium range up to the size of a continent or a nation. Furthermore, even if we found an asteroid which was on an impact trajectory with the Earth, say it was going to impact a few years from now, and we knew it was coming, we have no defense systems. We have no demonstrated capability to divert such a threatening object and ensure the defense of the Earth from that collision. And a related threat comes from also long period comets which are distinct from asteroids because they spend the vast majority of their time not in the inner solar system, but in the farthest outreaches of the outer solar system, far beyond our detection capabilities. And although these comets are significantly less frequent, they're generally much larger and far more difficult to detect and extremely challenging to divert. And we'll just plan animation briefly of one example of this. This is, this is data from an actual event that occurred uh, in 1996, this comet was dis discovered only less than two years before making a close pass by the Earth, as we see this close pass here. If that had been on an impact trajectory, there's nothing we could have done. That could have been an extinction event right there with this comet passing in. Just an example of um, how difficult these challenges can be from comets. So while most potential threats from near-Earth asteroids are thought to be limited to local scale or up to continental scale effects, uh, an impact with comets, a comet like this, would likely be a global extinction event, threatening the entire existence of humanity on this planet. So in line with this strategic defense initiative perspective, efforts can be taken to build up mankind's defensive capabilities against these threats taking us directly back to LaRouche's SDI principle. The same joint science driver programs to expand mankind's capabilities in space generally for the defense of Earth are the same programs that can generate the economic and political growth on this planet needed to erode and address the underlying causes of conflict and warfare, as Mr. LaRouche discussed. As Mr. LaRouche stated in his 1984 LaRouche Doctrine, which Mrs. Helga Zepp LaRouche had quoted from earlier in, in her keynote address today, the most important program, LaRouche says in that document, uh, is a multi-generational Moon and Mars colonization project driven by fusion technologies, while at the same time expanding technology sharing and capital goods export policies throughout 
the less developed regions of the planet. Again, ensuring the preconditions for, for durable peace and durable survival are met and the causes underlying future conflicts are removed before those conflicts can arise. Again, this st strategic defense of Earth perspective forces us to see our common place in our solar system, within our galaxy, and locate our actions on this relatively small planet from that perspective. So to continue that line of thought, I'd like to um, read a quote from Vladimir Vernatsky, who was a Russian biogeochemist. In the opening section of his 1927 writing, The Biosphere, he says, the history of the biosphere is sharply distinguished from that of the rest of the planet, and the role it plays in the planetary mechanism is quite exceptional. It is as much or even more the creation of the sun as it is a manifestation of terrestrial processes. One area of study I'd like to raise that could give us unique insight into the role of extraterrestrial factors in shaping the biosphere and the evolution of life on Earth is viruses. Now, viruses are a relatively new object of study for humanity, not discovered until the end of the 19th century and not imaged until the 1930s with the invention of the electron microscope. However, since that time, what has become undeniable is that viruses are inseparable from life. They are pervasive throughout the biosphere and are known to infect every type of organism. To give a quick sense of the ubiquity of viruses on the planet, there are millions of, of virus particles in a single teaspoon of seawater. Billions of viruses float in the air currents high above your head in the atmosphere. Even inside the human body, just as we have a microbiome of trillions of bacteria living inside of us, we also, and other organisms as well, we also have a virome with likely trillions of little viruses living inside of us as a regular part of our organism some of which are an essential part of our immune system. Viruses also play an important role in a phenomenon called horizontal gene transfer. Now, we normally think of gene transfer as happening from parent to offspring. Horizontal gene transfer transfers genetic material from one organism to another unrelated organism and it's incorporated into the genome of that next organism. Now this has been known for some time to occur regularly with single-celled organisms, bacteria and so forth, but studies in the past decades have shown this to have occurred between many types of much more complicated organisms, including fungi, plants, and animals. Well, Specific figures on this are still being debated. Some suggest that upwards of 100 genes in the human genome were transferred there at some point long ago by viruses. Some of these genes are very important ones dealing with metabolism, reproduction, and immune system response. This idea completely disrupts the typical textbook view of the tree of life with its separate parallel branches, and it posits a notion of evolution which is much more interconnected and complex. So now I'd like to take that idea and look at it in the context of the solar system and the galaxy. First is some very interesting research that was begun and presented in the 1980s by Dr. Robert Hope Simpson, among others, on the seasonal pandemics of influenza A, which like many other seasonal pandemics that we're all, or I'm sorry, seasonal phenomena that we're all familiar with, which are connected with solar radiation, 
breaks out somewhat simultaneously in the winter in the northern hemisphere, migrates across the tropics to the southern hemisphere for their winter, and then returns the following winter to the northern hemisphere. One element that interested researchers was the rhythm of outbreak of new strains of influenza, which if we look back over the 20th century, shows a very interesting, even if not perfect, correlation with the 11 year solar cycle, as we see on the slide here. So here you see pandemics from the 1940s to the 1970s uh, mapped on top of the cycles of solar activity. Now, if we look back over a long, longer period of time, 300 years, we see the possible fingerprint of a larger process, perhaps a galactic driver. So not only do pandemics tend to occur more frequently during periods of solar maximum, but as you see here, indicated by the peaks of the blue curve, they tend to cluster around periods where solar maxima are more intense. We also have the anomalous years of pandemic during solar minimum. And studies were done which showed a very interesting um, fact, which is that these years were also years during which the Earth received a higher influx of cosmic radiation from galactic sources due to, among other causes, bright supernova. But a question mark left by these researchers was what is the mechanism? This is unanswered. It's known that viruses can be activated and deactivated by certain frequencies of light. It's also been observed in many astronauts on the International Space Station that viral, uh, vir virus infections that were latent would suddenly become active again. While all of this research is quite preliminary and requires much, much further investigation, it is undeniable that the anomalies that I've hinted at here point to a higher causality, a modulator of the development of life on Earth, which is beyond earthbound chemical reactions. Now, I think it's safe to say, having spent just 20 of the past couple millions of years that human beings have been on the planet, um, just 20 of those years being able to study life outside of the Earth environment, as we have on the ISS. We are mere infants in our understanding of the science of life. In the 1980s, Lyndon LaRouche called for massive investment in research into the field of optical biophysics, electromagnetic radiation as a part of the physics of living processes a move beyond a merely chemical approach to life. This is not an option. As we move civilization more and more off of the planet, out into the solar system, we are going to be forced to deal with life in the cosmic environment, interacting with galactic processes in a relatively unmediated way. This demands a new and collaborative approach to the science of life. So to bring a conclusion to these thoughts that we've been elaborating, we're going to return our thinking to the immediate situation and reflect on just how much work is needed to bring our institutions and our ideas and outlooks into coherence with the perspective that we just heard. For example, how effective is the current idea of a Department of Defense? Can missiles defend us against asteroid current missiles? No. Can bombs save the life of your mother if she's unable to receive adequate treatment and is dying of COVID-19 induced hypoxia? No. We will develop one or more vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 virus, but what will be the form of a vaccine against asteroids? How can we inoculate ourselves against anti-human, ugly patterns of thought that are both widespread and tragic? How can tragedy be overcome in a durable and ongoing way? 
Well, Lyndon LaRouche insisted, and Helga very strongly stated in the first panel, that an essential step towards creating a healthy culture on this planet is to achieve a summit of the leaders of the United States, of China, of Russia, of India, to shape a truly new paradigm of international relations. We do have to work out a global approach to COVID-19, and we have to work out an international system that will go beyond just making sure we have enough ventilators and PPE, but to achieve the economic and cultural development required to completely eliminate poverty 100 percent worldwide and provide for the hygiene, the sanitation, the health, and the optimism and the science of the next chapter of the human experience. The world urgently needs a new paradigm for international collaboration on science, defined by the defense and growth of society and without the poison of ugly and old ideas. Life sciences can't rely on the largesse of a few billionaires who happen to enjoy investing money in it. Consider the billions made off of the misery inflicted by opioids and the relative paucity of money invested into studying diseases of plants and animals, many of which could potentially start threatening us next week. We could have another outbreak. Government funding has to be dramatically increased so that the benefits can be public. Basic research is needed. Our progress in learning more about and improving our mastery over the universe, that is the truest sense of defense in the broadest scale. We must ensure that as we move ahead, this is a shared mission of mankind. So the three of us will be available during the Q&A period uh, if you have questions about any of the content that we just discovered, uh, discussed. And we're going to, uh, to move on now to our next speaker after just again briefly mentioning the first volume of the Lyndon LaRouche Collected Works, which are available at the LaRouche Legacy Foundation's website, LaRoucheLegacyFoundation.org. Um, Megan Beats is one of the co-directors of the LaRouche Legacy Foundation and helped make this possible. So our next speaker, to introduce our next speaker, uh, he is Dr. Jean-Pierre Luminet. And he is a French astrophysicist, he's a writer, he's a poet, he's well known internationally for his work on uh, cosmology and black holes in particular. He worked as research director and currently is emeritus researcher at the prestigious CNRS in France, the National Center of Scientific Research. And he will be addressing some of the questions raised in this last discussion about errors in scientific method itself. The title of Dr. Lumine's talk is The Role of Free Invention in Creative Discovery. So here's Dr. Jean-Pierre Lumine. Bonjour. Au début du XXe siècle, le poète et philosophe Paul Valéry a écrit dans ses cahiers « Les événements sont l'écume des choses, mais c'est la mer qui m'intéresse ». Cet aphorisme est vertigineux. Il dit tout de ce que cherche le physicien sous la chair aride des équations. Ce que cherche aussi le poète hein, sous la cape de velours de ses mots. Symbole de la profondeur, la mer est dépositaire de l'essentiel. Mais qu'est-ce que l'essentiel Pour le scientifique ordinaire, c'est la réalité du monde, si tant est que l'expression fasse sens. Et pour le physicien théoricien, tout comme pour l'artiste et le créateur en général, la vraie réalité du monde n'est-elle pas plutôt la vie de l'esprit, elle qui s'écarte de toute sollicitation passagère liée aux événements extérieurs Dans la pensée de Valérie, la profondeur de la vitalité marine est suffisamment riche pour accueillir les manifestations les plus ténues et les plus éphémères de l'expérience. Un petit fait d'écume, un événement candide sur l'obscur de la mer. Note Valérie, une fois de plus. Le contraste entre la mer et l'écume exprime le décalage saisissant entre l'unité, associée à la permanence, et l'accident, associé à l'évanescence. Dans d'autres contextes, comme celui sur lequel je travaille actuellement, à savoir la physique théorique moderne qui tente d'unifier les lois de la gravitation et de la mécanique quantique, il traduit plutôt une complémentarité par laquelle les parties constituantes ne sont plus décalées mais concordantes. Alors je prends pour exemple une brillante hypothèse avancée par le grand physicien John Wheeler dans les années 1950. 
Les esprits les plus créatifs fonctionnent souvent par analogie. Wheeler imagine donc qu'au niveau microscopique, la géométrie même de l'espace-temps n'est pas fixe, mais en perpétuel changement, agité de fluctuations d'origine quantique. On peut la comparer à la surface d'une mer agitée. Vue de très haut, la mer paraît lisse. À plus basse altitude, on commence à percevoir des mouvements qui agitent sa surface, mais laquelle reste cependant continue. Mais examinée de près, la mer est tumultueuse, fragmentée, discontinue. Des vagues s'élèvent, se brisent, projettent des gouttes d'eau qui se détachent et retombent. De façon analogue, l'espace-temps paraîtrait lisse à notre échelle, mais scruté à un niveau ultra-microscopique, son écume deviendrait perceptible sous forme d'événements évanescents et transitoires, des particules élémentaires, des micro-trous de verre, et pourquoi pas des univers entiers. Tout comme la turbulence hydrodynamique fait naître des bulles par cavitation, la turbulence spatio-temporelle ferait surgir en permanence du vide quantique ce que nous prenons pour la réalité du monde. Alors tout ceci est superbement poétique, mais n'implique pas pour autant que ce soit physiquement correct. 50 ans après sa formulation, le concept d'écume du vide quantique posé par par John Wheeler, fait toujours débat. Et d'autres approches de la gravitation quantique se sont développées, proposant des visions différentes de l'espace-temps à son niveau le plus profond, l'équivalent de la mer, et de ses manifestations à toutes les échelles de grandeur et d'énergie, l'équivalent de l'écume. Mais si aucune de ces approches, comme la théorie des cordes, la gravité quantique à boucle, ou encore la géométrie non commutative, n'a encore abouti à une description cohérente, ces diverses théories ont au moins le mérite de montrer combien l'investigation scientifique de la nature est une prodigieuse aventure de l'esprit. Oui, déchiffrer les fragments du réel sous l'écume des astres, c'est se détacher des limites du visible, se déshabituer des représentations trompeuses, sans jamais oublier que la fécondité de l'approche scientifique est souterrainement irriguée par d'autres disciplines de l'esprit humain, comme l'art, la poésie, la musique, la philosophie. Alors ceci nous ramène à, à Paul Valéry. La préscience de son propos n'a pas lieu de nous étonner lorsqu'on connaît son parcours. Curieux de tout, Valéry s'intéressait notamment à la façon dont les grands scientifiques travaillent mentalement. Il est lui-même fourmillé d'idées, et pour n'en laisser échapper aucune, il noircissait en longueur de temps les pages de son carnet. Au cours des années 1920, il a rencontré à plusieurs reprises Albert Einstein, qu'il admirait, et réciproquement d'ailleurs. Et le facétieux, le facétieux père de la théorie de la relativité s'est souvenu plus tard d'un débat public au Collège de France à Paris en présence de Paul Valéry et du philosophe Henri, Ber Henri Bergson. Et il raconte « Au cours de la discussion, Valéry m'a demandé si je me levais la nuit pour noter une idée, et je lui ai répondu « Mais des idées, on n'en a qu'une ou deux dans sa vie. » Alors lorsque ce fut au tour d'Einstein d'interroger un autre poète, Saint John Perse, sur la façon dont il travaillait, l'explication qu'il a reçue euh, euh, ne manqua pas de le satisfaire. Mais c'est la même chose pour le savant. Le mécanisme de la découverte n'est ni logique, ni intellectuel. Au départ, il y a un bond de l'imagination. Dans son discours de remise du prix Nobel de littérature en 1960, Saint John Perse a d'ailleurs appelé cela le mystère commun. Einstein a, a d'ailleurs surenchéri sur le rôle primordial de l'imagination dans la créativité scientifique. Et à ce stade, il est quand même fascinant de constater le pari qui est fait sur la liberté d'invention des concepts fondamentaux permettant d'interpréter le monde. Einstein estimait déjà que les principes d'une théorie globale ne pouvaient pas être extraits de la seule expérience et de la seule méthode scientifique au sens strict du terme. Citation « Nous savons désormais que la science ne peut naître de la seule expérience immédiate et qu'il nous est impossible, lorsque nous en construisons l'édifice, de nous passer de l'invention libre dont nous ne pouvons vérifier l'utilité qu'a posteriori à la lumière de notre expérience. Par conviction que nous sommes en mesure, grâce à une construction purement mathématique, de trouver les concepts ainsi que les lois qui les relient, propres à nous ouvrir les portes de la compréhension des phénomènes naturels. Fin de citation. 
prendre à bras le corps la question de l'énoncé poétique de Valérie, dans ses potentialités, mais aussi dans ses limites, face au champ des équations qui échappe en fait aux mots de l'ordinaire des jours, ben tel doit, doit être le propos de la véritable culture scientifique, et qui est absolument contraire à la mode du jour, consistant plutôt à, à accumuler des tableaux de chiffres, des formules, des codes, des, des protocoles et des statistiques trompeuses, et embourrer le crâne des jeunes qui sont désireux d'apprendre et de comprendre. La véritable culture scientifique fait le pari de rendre moins innommable le vertigineux mystère du monde qui nous entoure et qui nous fait. Et en acceptant son étrangeté, le public, et en particulier les jeunes, gagnera à accueillir quelques pierres durables, au moins le temps d'un mouvement d'univers. Oui, comme l'écrivait déjà en 1605 le grand Johannes Kepler à un confrère astronome, « C'est ainsi que nous progressons à tâtons dans un rêve pareil à des enfants sages, mais immature. Au même titre que quelques autres grands novateurs de l'histoire des sciences et des idées, ben Kepler offre justement un modèle très instructif sur la, la manière de penser le monde par rapport à la doxa. En 1975, le philosophe Paul Feyerabend a publié « Contre la méthode », un ouvrage dont la thèse principale étayé par de nombreux exemples historiques, et que non seulement la méthode scientifique classique n'est pas la seule façon valide d'acquérir des connaissances, mais que, appliquée trop strictement, elle finit par bloquer la créativité et l'invention. La science serait en fait une entreprise essentiellement anarchiste, au sens où l'origine des idées pour la faire peuvent venir de partout, c'est-à-dire de l'art, de la littérature, de la poésie, de la philosophie et même du mythe. L'anarchisme théorique serait ainsi davantage humaniste et plus propre à encourager le progrès que les doctrines fondées sur la loi et l'ordre. Alors je n'irai pas jusqu'à approuver l'attitude extrême de certains disciples de Feyerabend consistant à dire que tout se est bon, que tout se vaut, et qui conduit finalement à une sorte de relativisme culturel absolu, qui mettrait par exemple sur le même plan de valeur une mélodie de Schubert et une chanson de, de Madonna, disons. Voilà. Comme en toute chose, la sagesse consiste à emprunter le juste chemin entre les deux. Et chez les partisans de la méthode, à l'exclusion de toute autre forme de pensée. Pourquoi ignorer, ou faire semblant d'ignorer, que l'imagination créatrice et des scientifiques fait indéniablement appel à des images mythiques et Par exemple, les principes générateurs, qui sont présents dans toutes les cultures, comme le désir, l'arbre, l'œuf, l'eau, le vide, le chaos, apparaissent clairement comme des archétypes de la pensée cosmogonique, c'est-à-dire les symboles primitifs et universels qui appartiennent à l'inconscient collectif, pour reprendre la célèbre terminologie de Jung. Alors, le terme d'archétype a d'ailleurs été utilisé pour la première fois par Kepler lui-même. Les traces de la géométrie sont imprimées dans le monde comme si la géométrie était une sorte d'archétype du monde, a-t-il écrit déjà en 1606 dans son traité sur l'étoile nouvelle de Stella Nova. Alors certes, L'œuvre des grands créateurs dans le domaine de la physique fondamentale ne laisse que rarement apparaître un arrière-plan philosophique qui la fonde. En première lecture, on est la plupart tenté de conclure à un rationalisme extrême, à une position fondamentalement sceptique. En réalité, derrière l'esprit critique du physicien inventif se cache souvent un profond intérêt pour tout ce qui a trait aux régions obscures de la réalité et à celles de l'imaginaire humain, lesquelles se trouvent en apparence opposées au concept de la raison. L'œuvre de réflexion épistémologique de Wolfgang Pauli, qui est par ailleurs l'un des pères de la mécanique quantique, exerce le scepticisme envers le scepticisme même, afin de, de traquer la façon dont se poursuit la connaissance avant qu'on en arrive à la compréhension rationnelle des choses. L'influence des représentations archétypales sur la formation des théories scientifiques est indéniable. Comme on l'a vu avec les, les déclarations d'Albert Einstein, 
Le physicien théoricien ne peut pas se satisfaire d'une vision purement empirique selon laquelle on ne pourrait établir des lois naturelles qu'à partir d'un matériau expérimental soumis à un strict protocole. Il s'agit plutôt en fait de s'interroger sur le rôle qui est joué par les décisions que l'on prend dans le processus d'observation et d'expérimentation et quel est celui que joue l'intuition. Et le pont qui relie le matériau expérimental, qui est initialement désordonné, se situe dans certaines images originelles qui préexistent dans, dans l'imaginaire. Ces archétypes ne sont pas liés à des idées rationnellement formulées. Il s'agit plutôt de, de formes ou d'images à fort contenu émotionnel que l'on ne saisit pas euh, par la pensée immédiate. Alors, le cas Kepler, auquel Paoli a consacré un ouvrage de même type, est à cet égard exemplaire. Paoli prend l'exemple de l'adoption par Kepler du système de Copernic. Et selon lui, en fait, le pouvoir de persuasion du système copernicien s'exerce avant tout chez Kepler grâce non pas à l'astronomie, mais à la correspondance qu'il y voit avec le symbole de la Trinité, qui est un archétype de la pensée chrétienne. À cette conception de la connaissance de la nature, selon laquelle l'ordre unitaire du cosmos n'est initialement pas formulable de façon rationnelle, mais renvoie pour l'essentiel à Platon et au néoplatonisme de Plotin et Proclus, mais avec une différence essentielle. C'est que chez Platon, les images, les images originelles sont immuables et elles existent indépendamment de la conscience humaine. Platon utilise le terme d'âme d'ailleurs. L'utilisation que fait Emmanuel Kant du concept de forme a priori de la sensibilité, appliquée au cadre géométrique, est tout autant critiquable, puisque cela l'a conduit à soutenir que les postulats de Clyde étaient inhérents à la pensée humaine. Or, les archétypes de la psychologie ne sont pas figés, ils peuvent évoluer relativement à une situation donnée de la connaissance. Le cosmologiste cherche à décrire cette étendue indéfinie qu'est l'espace au moyen d'un modèle géométrique. Alors, plusieurs modèles sont possibles. Et la description obtenue dépend notamment du degré de, de finesse et de subtilité avec lequel l'espace physique est analysé. Et de fait, pendant longtemps, ben, l'espace euclidien était le seul espace connu des mathématiciens. C'était le cas encore à l'époque de Kant, avant que l'on ne découvre les géométries non euclidiennes. En outre, l'être humain a une tendance instinctive à interpréter ses perceptions sensorielles dans le sens de la géométrie euclidienne. Oui, il a été démontré en fait, que les canaux semi-circulaires de notre oreille interne, qui détectent les accélérations angulaires de la tête dans trois plans perpendiculaires, construisent un espace mental de structure localement euclidienne. Il a donc fallu un singulier travail intellectuel pour comprendre que les postulats de cette structure euclidienne ben, ne sont pas les seuls possibles. Et donc, euh, affirmer que l'espace possède trois ou onze dimensions, qu'il est fini ou infini, sans bord, plat ou courbé, euh, monoconnexe, multiconnexe, etc., n'a absolument rien d'évident, et c'est même, dans la plupart des cas, contre-intuitif. Et donc, en ce cas, l'idée doit nécessairement préexister à l'expérience sensible. Voilà, on doit donc bel et bien placer euh, ce que Einstein a appelé la libre invention théorique au cœur même du processus de la découverte. Après tout, comme l'écrivait le poète Novalis, il en va des théories comme de la pêche, seul celui qui lance risque d'attraper quelque chose. Alors je crois que depuis plusieurs décennies, l'Institut Schiller a, a entre autres vocation celle de promouvoir cette manière féconde de penser le monde, et je suis heureux d'avoir pu la partager avec vous, je vous remercie pour votre attention. Good. I, I recognize that some listeners um, were not able to see the subtitles, or if you are blind and couldn't read them, the transcript will be posted on our site in English as well. So for our next speaker, we're going to be hearing from an astronaut, a French astronaut. And given the time in France, we're very glad that he's able to be on with us this late. And I'd also like to make sure that everybody knows that if you have a question um, for our next speaker, please email it in uh, right away since, so that we'll be able to have a short dialogue with him before it gets too late. 
Michel Tonini is a French test pilot, engineer, and former astronaut with the Centre National d'Études Spatiales, the French <laughs> Space Agency. He's also the former head of the European Astronaut Center and the Europe of the European Space Agency, and one of the founding members of the Association of Space Explorers. He has logged a total of 19 days in space aboard the Soyuz, the Mir station, the Space Shuttle Columbia, and the International Space Station. What an impressive uh, international uh, space presence. His presentation today is entitled Friendship Between Astronauts, an Exemplary Precedent for International Cooperation. Michel Tonini. Hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to speak about uh, cooperation between uh, astronauts and cosmonauts. And uh, I will ask you to give the next slide, please, if you can. We are going to talk about uh, a brief history of, history of space and the cooperation between uh, what we did in space. So next slide. And next as well. So if we look at uh, what we did in the beginning, we had the first flight of uh, Sputnik in uh, 1957. It was a big surprise all over the world because nobody was expecting this Sputnik to fly in space except uh, the Soviet at the time. And um, if you see very well uh, the Sputnik as it is designed, it is metallic and it was making a beep because that was um, a tool to be seen and to be heard all over the world. It was a propaganda tool about space. Next, 1961, was the first flight, uh, the first human flight of uh, Yuri Gagarin. It was the first time that a human left the Earth to go to space. He did one turn of the Earth, which is one hour and 40 minutes only, and he landed safely, and that was the beginning of the space, human space exploration. Then, humans have been to space regularly. They have been to the moon, and they have been to the International Space Station. If we consider all the flight made from Gagarin up to today, we have spent roughly 150 years in space. Next slide. Other dates, uh, important as well, are 1962, John Glenn, the first American, went to space. So you can see at the beginning was a Russian and then American. 1963, the first female in space. It was uh, uh, Valentina Tereshkova, she was a Russian. 1965, the first space work, Alexei Leonov, went to a spacecraft in space and then he went outside of the spacecraft with a spacesuit to spare a little bit like uh, 15 minutes in the space work. Then 1969, you all know the first landing on the moon with Armstrong and Aldrin. 1981, the first space shuttle flight. Uh, the shuttle flight, the space shuttle flew roughly 30 years. 2001, the first tourist in space, Denis Tito, who was American. His dream was to fly in space and he had to pay his mission. So that was a way to demonstrate that the human space missions are safe enough to be flown by tourists. 2003, Yang Li Wei, the first Chinese in space, we call them Taikonaut. 2012, Spurst, the first SpaceX mission. That was a mission made by Elon Musk. It was a private company going to space with a dream and with a goal to send humans to space. And I can tell you, in 2012, when it started, nobody believed that he would, spend, he would send the human in space. But this year, in May 2020, he will send the first human mission to the space station. And 2017, China announced its plan to return to the moon, to go to the moon, to export the soul of the moon. Next slide. So you can see on this slide the fact that uh, Russian and American had a different path to flight, to the, to the space flight. Uh, Russian had a classical rocket called Soyuz and a classical capsule. They made the progressive evolution of the rocket at the capsule in order to fly almost the same rocket and the same capsule, but much more modern. And they had the seven uh, space stations called Salyut from one to seven. They were the Mir space station that was used also to do the first flight between the space shuttle and the first docking of the space shuttle to a space station. And they tried to land a human on the moon. 
but they could not and they fell. On the other side, the American had the Mercury for one person, Gemini for two persons, Apollo for three persons to go to the moon and to go to their space station called Skylab. They went to the moon six times safely and successfully. They had a space shuttle. So it was more for the American a zigzag uh, path. And we can say that uh, uh, at the time when you see the two left and right column, it was a kind of a confrontation between American and Russian. But there was a flight called ASTP, called Apollo Soyuz Space Mission in 1975, where uh, Soyuz went to space, uh, Apollo spacecraft went to space, they docked into space, went to dock, they opened the door, they shake their hand, they give some gift, and they started a very strong friendship. And if you see the next slide, the next slide show you the crew of this uh, Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. In green, you have the Russian. In, uh, in uh, dark uh, brown, you have the light brown, you have the American. And on this uh, five crew member, two persons, one American, one Russian, became very good friends. This first mission was made because of a good friendship between two persons. And usually when I make the speech, I, ex I ask the people in the room to tell me who are the two persons. So I will tell you today, because you cannot speak to me, the two persons are the two a little bit bored on the back. Tom Stafford, American fighter pilot, test pilot, and astronaut. And on the right side, on the right side is Alexei Leonov, who was also the first uh, uh, man who went to the space work. He was also a very courageous uh, space uh, fighter pilot. And these two persons became friends at this mission, before the mission, when they met in 1972, during the mission that was very successful, and, right, and also after the mission. And the picture right after show you the two men uh, where, as they are today, or as they could be today. Next slide, please. So you can see on the left, uh, Tom Stafford, on the right, Alexei Lenov. So it was 45 years of uh, true friendship. I can tell you that every year, Tom Stafford went to visit Alexei Lenov in Russia to spend a few days with him on vacations. And every year, Alexei Lenov went to America to spend a few days with his friend, Tom Stafford. And even sometime where the relationship between the two countries was slightly heavy, we asked them, the two countries, the two governments, asked them to try to solve the problem. Uh, unfortunately, Alexei Lenov passed away a few months ago, so this friendship is not uh, anymore. But the next slide will show you that uh, we continue this friendship, as you can see, in space. We have today uh, a space station, and these are young people of the space station. On the left side, you have a Russian cosmonaut. On the right side is an American astronaut. They fly in space. They fly long-duration flight in space since 20 years now, and they have a very strong relationship, and they have a good trust because they can cut the hair one to the other. And this has led to what we call the AAC, which is Association of Space Explorers, which was made 35 years ago. Uh, this Association of Space Explorers includes 38 different countries, and this was made and created, association was created in 1985 in France. And since then, we meet every year in a different country of the world. So next slide show you that we went from the confrontation to cooperation slightly. The confrontation gave very good speed to the space program. Remember when John Kennedy asked the country to go to the moon, uh, NASA went to the moon in eight years, which is very, very fast. But there was less emphasis on the scientific content. Today we have a cooperation which is a slower evolution, but more focused on science. And we do have a cooperation between five partners, which are NASA, Russian, European, uh, Japan, and Canada. And also we try slowly to have China and India with, with us to have seven partners in space. In this case, you could have, next slide please, you could have a pattern to fly in space with seven different space agencies. And the seven space agencies would have seven tasks to go to the moon or to go to Mars. On 
This slide, you can see that one space agency could be in charge of the launch site. The second space agency could be responsible of the access to low Earth orbit, what we call LEO. The third space agency would be in charge of the MTFA, which is a low Earth orbit small space station. The fourth space agency would be in charge of the transfer with a tug from low Earth orbit to the moon orbit. The number five would be the MTF on the moon. The number six would be the descent to the moon. And the number seven would be the lunar base. If you, you can see it on this diagram that uh, we can share all activities between the whole world to have a common goal of uh, going to space together. Next slide, show you what we did uh, achieve with the space station. The first mission was in 1998. What we did with this mission is a real Apollo Soyuz mission with a left module that you call the FGB launched from Baikonur on a proton rocket. The right module was the node number one launched on the space shuttle from Kennedy Space Center. And the two were docked together with a robotic arm from Canada. That was the beginning of the building of the space station. Next slide, I'll show you that we put a third module called service module. Inside you have oxygen, you have life, therefore there is a Soyuz on the back in order to bring people in space. That was the beginning of the space station with three persons on board. And the next slide show you the complete, uh, the complete space station with uh, the space shuttle on the top, the US part on the front, on the top part of the picture, the trail with the solar panel on the side, and on the back side, you have the Russian side and you have the European ATV that was able to, to fly five times to the space station in order to be paid for the launch of Columbus that you can see on the left front side of the, of the station. Next slide show you the current, one of the current position of the space station. You can see that we have uh, two Soyuzes, two progresses, and we can uh, congratulate the Russian as Today, they launch uh, Progress, which is like a Soyuz, but automatic. And they, they had a record of the docking time because they were from, uh, from, from ground to the space station in less than three hours and a half, which is a, the, the shortest time they go to space. And you can see on the left side, the Dragon and Cygnus, these are made by private company. And the beam is an inflatable structure docked to the space station in order in the future to have less weight and less volume from Earth to space. Next slide, please. So the first mission was one hour and 40 minutes. That was the one of Gagarin. We slowly made an evolution on the duration of the space flight in order to go for one hour to one day, one week, two weeks, and then six months. All the flight today are six months durations. Some flights have been one year. The record was 14 months with uh, Valery Polyakov. So we knew that uh, we, could, uh, we could cope with the fact that we lost muscles in space, we lost calcium in space, so we can do exercise every day, two hours of uh, exercise to compensate with this loss. In parallel, we understood that the difficulty was the psychological behavior. So we did some study on the ground with mass 500, 18 months on the ground with six international people in order to simulate a flight to Mars, and also a flight on Hawaii with one French person, one year or one year and a half mission completed. That was also to test the psychological behavior in this long uh, period of uh, confinement. And the goal is to have best knowledge of human behavior in space in order to make a trip to the moon, to Mars, or to an asteroid. Next slide. So the goal is to make a long duration flight and to stay in space longer and, and longer, and also to be able to, to make operation in space, like uh, repairing a satellite or doing space work or building some structure in space, like we did on the space station. But because we're in space, we use the fact that we're in zero G to control, to do some science, like the control of uh, mass loss during long flight or study on the risk of kidney stones during long flight. Next slide, next slide, please. And this also is an application of what we could do in space. We start to do it, is the growth of proton crystal. You see on the 
top left picture what is a protein crystal growth in, on Earth, and the one on the right side is the one on space. Because you're on the OG, the special protein is bigger, so you can have a better uh, presentation of the disease, and you can make some special medicine much more precise because of that. Next slide shows you also an impact of a space mission, which is education. When uh, Kennedy initiated the program of Apollo, where the top record of uh, students going for PhDs, uh, physical science, and engineering uh, diploma. It was the same in front when we have a French astronaut flying in space. Students want to, f to study more science to better understand what's going on in space and better understand what is science in space. And the space station we have today, which is a real success, we can say that. Uh, all the building of the space station was successful, all the flights are successful. There is permanently on the space station at least one American and one Russian, and they do work very well together. This cooperation program is between Russia, United States, European, Canada, and Japan. In Europe, 10 countries participate to this program. So all together, 15 countries work together. And it was a program made for joint science together with the participation of uh, Russia in 1993. And the next slide will be my, mess, my last, uh, next slide, please, will be my last slide, which is a phrase of uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. The Earth is a cradle of humanity, but mankind cannot stay in a cradle forever. This is uh, why we go to space, and this is also why we want to increase our knowledge day after day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michel Tonini. Um, if you have time, I, there are a few questions that came in for you. I can I can sort of try to combine it into one question so that you can you can okay. just answer it together. <laughs> okay, thank okay, you. Okay, I will try. Okay, um, so one of the questions was about uh, someone was saying that it seems like you had a very unique uh, uh, background for being involved in the U.S. and the Russian space agencies. They wonder what the biggest lesson you learned for advising the future would be based on that. Um, another question asks about how countries should work together to do the Moon-Mars program. This is an American, and she says, this seems like it's too big for America to do alone. Should we work with other countries? And a Serbian, um, the Sir a uh, member of the executive board of the Serbian Office for Space Sciences, asks about international cooperation for space. Um, this person writes that, I am a strong advocate that outer space should be considered as a common heritage of mankind, as the UN conferences also say. In this light, and being a space developing country, we are facing problems as well as many other countries to join the space club. I would like to hear your opinion on how we can rethink the global approach to outer space activities, policies, and research. So I will try to reply to your question one after the other. So you said, oh. what did I learn from this uh, cooperation with Russia and with NASA? Yes. Well, I learned, I learned humility. Hmm. And I think humility is really important for astronauts, from people on Earth, and also for the consideration that uh, uh, life is very fragile. And uh, as someone said before, we could be hit by a comet or by an asteroid at any time. And we need to have a plan to fight against an asteroid or a comet. And the only way to fight against this uh, danger is to work together. In uh, the Association of Space Explorers, where we have 38 different countries and 38 different astronauts from these countries, we have a plan to study every year the way to deflect an asteroid from Earth. Today, it's an automatic program, but in the future, we try to make it maybe a human program. And the second question is how to go to Moon and Mars. I strongly believe that slowly, we need to cooperate together, even with China and India, because they have a very they have a very good potential of uh, programming space. And the example of the space station, the International Space Station, is an example that could be applied to the whole world. 
if we could succeed it for the International Space Station, we are obliged to succeed if we include China and India together. So I believe in it. And for the question of, the, of Serbia, uh, you know that uh, Serbia could participate to a space program, uh, where it is with Russia or where it is with ESA, with the European Space Agency. So it's a, it's a political organization, it's a political will, but if a country wants to participate in space at any level, if then even at 1% of budget, it is possible to do it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. We know it's late there, and uh, we're very, very happy to have had your participation. Thank you, Michel Tonini. Thank you very much, and good evening to all of you. Thank you. So we had um, sent in, not as a question, but actually as, a, uh, as an interesting comment, um, a statement that was made today by President Trump of the United States and President Putin of the Russian Federation on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the meeting on the Elba, which Dennis mentioned in his introduction to this conference. Here I'd like to read their joint statement by Trump and Putin. April 25th, 2020 marks the 75th anniversary of the historic meeting between American and Soviet troops who shook hands on the damaged bridge over the Elba River. This event heralded the de decisive defeat of the Nazi regime. The meeting on the Elba represented a culmination of tremendous efforts by many countries and peoples that joined forces under the framework of the United Nations Declaration of 1942. This common struggle required enormous sacrifice by millions of soldiers, sailors, and citizens in multiple theaters of war. We also recognize the contributions from millions of men and women on the home front who forged vast quantities of war materials for use around the world. Workers and manufacturers played a crucial role in supplying the Allied forces with the tools necessary for victory. The spirit of the Elba is an example of how our countries can put aside differences, build trust, and cooperate in pursuit of a greater cause. As we work today to confront the most important challenges of the 21st century, we pay tribute to the valor and courage of all those who fought together to defeat fascism. Their heroic feat will never be forgotten. That is the joint statement by Presidents uh, uh, Putin and uh, Trump. For our next uh, speaker, we're going to be hearing from an American astronaut. Walt Cunningham is a retired American astronaut who served as the lunar module pilot on the 11-day Apollo 7 mission, which was the first Apollo that brought human beings into space. During the flight, the three-member crew did exercises in docking and lunar orbital rendezvous, completed eight successful tests in maneuvering injections, ignitions of the service module propulsion engine, measured the accuracy of performance of the spacecraft systems, and provided the first effective television transmission on board crew activities. Although among his many decorations and honors, Walt Cunningham is a recipient of the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, an Associate Fellow of the American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics, and a Fellow of the American Astronautical Society. In preparation for this conference today, we asked him about his historic flight and the contributions that flight made to fulfilling the vision laid out by President Kennedy and to making the Apollo moon landing missions that came after a success. Let's hear Walt Cunningham's presentation, entitled Apollo 7 and Astronauts' Reflections. My, my personal assessment is you really, you shouldn't be there unless you're willing to stick your necks out a little. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me years after that to fully put into uh, uh, the right perspective on this, uh, the fighter pilots. I have to tell you, uh, in my book, I have a section on there where, I, where the day that I decided I was going to apply to be an astronaut, 
that morning I was actually I was getting I was getting my college degree when I was in, in my uh, mid twenties. I had not been to college. I joined the Navy out of high school. I managed to pass two year test, became a fighter pilot, smart enough to go in the Marine Corps instead of the Navy, which I never regret. <laughs> but I was going to, the, to college trying to get, get a degree that year and I was driving in the morning, I was working at the Rand Corporation and I was driving that morning and they were going through the countdown for uh, Alan Shepard. And <clears throat> it was 19, was that, I can't remember what, exactly what year 61, that was. 61, wasn't it? Was it 61? 61 or two, I can't remember, yeah, 61, I think. Maybe. Yeah. Like, and he was, um, on the East Coast, and I'm driving along in my car, and we didn't have all those freeways out in LA at the time. I was going to UCLA. It got down to the last four or five minutes, and I had to pull over to the side of the road and park so I could hear what was going on. I, c I couldn't even keep driving. Right. And it got down, and I remember the count five, four, three, two, one lift off then i i caught myself screaming out you lucky sob <laughs> <laughs> and up to that time i had i would just be i, I thought about like it was alone for the ride i looked around to make sure there was nobody parking that was looking at me and uh that was when I decided that that was what I was going to do. I had back, good background for it. <clears throat> and 18 months later, I was sharing an office with Alan. And uh, it, was, it was like joining a uni uh, very unusual, <clears throat> unique kind of life at the time. And that's evolved the way a lot of these kind of things do. When we first had uh, human beings sail around the world mm. that's different than how they evolved into consistent kind of systems out there in, in the oceans <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> now as time goes on and i can only speak for myself i'm sure a lot of the other people feel the same way too but as you get older and you get more mature, you can put in perspective some of these things that, at the time you never even thought about. It. You just took it for granted. And when he was making his speech, I remember mm -hmm. uh, that was that was before I had been selected by NASA. Uh, I got selected the first time I applied eventually. But I can remember you know, when he was saying that. I just that was a good speech, you know. Now, now it's uh, something that goes down in history. Mm -hmm. on that and i think it's because at the time our minds were not working quite the same way and and so you've got you've got to let your minds mature in order mm -hmm. to get the perspective on what's going on historically it was a unique period in our history for the people here with that kind of a uh, activity to move to and if you go mm -hmm. back 500 years and you look at the first time they set out to sail around the world, and I have to tell you, I think of the I think they started off with about 240 people, or maybe what was it, four ships when they got when they finally made it an hour and a year and a half or two years later, there was eight 18 of those original people still alive, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those and they had made it around the world, and they were willing to pay the price and they moved our society forward. And we felt, we felt a lot of pluses going on in society after that. That was 500 years ago. The, the society and the world benefits from being willing to stick your neck out, but not doing it wildly. You gotta be committed to what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and I'm sure that I, I feel speak a lot more about that now than I ever did at the time because mm -hmm. you've got to get wise in what you do.
some of the, I think that they've said uh, 25 or 35% of the people had a reaction to zero G, you know, throwing up the first day and stuff like that on it. But they were all committed to, they would all go on anyway. Mm -hmm. The amount of weight that was lost by those folks, our, ours was the longest Apollo mission, I think. There might have been one more mission, slightly longer. And I think the most anybody lost weight on our mission was 10 pounds, something like that. Uh, and the attitude of the people in those days was different than the attitudes today because we were all military fighter pilots. And whether the world likes it or not, it takes a certain attitude on that to justify mm -hmm. having those kind of activities from one from one uh, country to another. Um, but I have to tell you this, uh, one of the reasons that our mission was such a success, first off, it's gotten a lot of criticism uh, because uh, Wally Shaw at the time, he had a, he had a cold and uh but i have to tell you this everything that wallen needed to do operationally he did it anyway but i it, it was a a problem with the verbiage back and forth you know because he was recovering from a cold and as a matter of fact they let he let the ground think that we all had a cold we didn't have a cold i didn't cough once uh don isley i think once or twice may have coughed but we we were juniors he was a very experienced guy, and whether we like it now at this stage, I think he did a very good job. He was a good pilot, in my opinion. At the time, that flight, uh, I think it surprised him because it was a uh, it was eleven eleven day mission, and. They added, uh, I think they added four different objects, uh, objectives to that mission. And the ground, I'm sure, had lots and lots of uh, reservations as to whether they would make 11 days when they did it. And I can remember the last couple of days, uh, we had some time almost on our hands because we didn't have a lot of film left. Now they take pictures all over the place. Our total film for the whole... 11 days and three of us using the camera was 500 pictures. I mean, now they might do that <laughs> with one pass around the earth. The world doesn't realize that 53% uh, of the earth's surface is covered by clouds. And whether we like it or not, uh, the, uh, the earth, most of the earth is uh, ocean out there. And back in, in those days, in fact, even today, they're almost totally dependent on air-to-ground communications. Mm -hmm. And now they've got a sense of, essentially pretty much 100% air-to-ground communications. But what we had for air-to-ground communications, 4% of our time. And you, had, and you had to be directly able to contact it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they say, oh, gee, that's horrible. No, we thought that was good <laughs> because we had so many things to do <laughs> that we, we felt it was good when we weren't getting pushed to do other things, you know. And, but we did need a certain amount of information. But, but four, it was four or four and a half percent of the time we, we had communication. But you, you're looking and talking to me at my age, and, and uh, you know, I'm 88 years old, and I'll tell you this. I thought we had a great mission. I really do. Not consider myself capable of giving the real overall best answer. I'm still stuck in that world of how important it is to be the world's greatest fighter pilot, mentally at least. Mm -hmm. But the other things that it's a different way of living and the public today has been educated now for 50 years. Most of them, not, I can't even say most of them, but many of them want that app opportunity to do that. And of course now they've, they're selling tickets to people, you know, to ride 
a spacecraft up there. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, 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 I can't look positively at all that stuff. I know it, it, it's got its positive stuff, but I, I live in a different world with it. Uh, and I think that they're fortunate if they become one of today's astronauts. But to do that, you better perfect yourself in the skills that it takes. And there's a lot of different skills that it takes today. There's a pretty good number of doctors, for example, that have been up there. Uh, and that's good. And uh, they've had a number of ladies. There's been a couple of lady pilots, incidentally, that I thought were, were pretty doggone outstanding. And so they, did, they did a real good job. You have to have the, edit, the attitude uh, that comes automatically if you're a, uh, a major league uh, uh, fighter pilot and uh, either the, the <clears throat> one of the best fighter pilots or at least, and I'm, I'm significant about this, at least believing you are. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of attitude when you go in uh, to uh, attack somebody else. Rightly or wrongly, you have to have the kind of confidence that says you're going to come out ahead and you're willing to pay whatever price it takes to get that done. That was Walt Cunningham, uh, an astronaut on Apollo 7, the first Apollo to take human beings into space. For our next speaker, actually I'll give you a sense of who's coming up. Um, our next speaker is a, uh, well, I'll introduce her in just a moment. Uh, following our next speaker will be a state senator who is a big supporter of nuclear fusion, a physics professor who has received two presidential appointments to national scientific positions, a Chinese physician speaking about their experience with COVID-19, and a New York City physician who is going to speak about what it's like in the uh, current hotspot here. So our next speaker, Dr. Marie Corzaga, is from Burkina Faso, and she holds a doctorate in astrophysics, with, and she specializes in the study of dark matter. She is West Africa's first female astrophysicist, and she seeks to share her love of science and its importance more broadly through expanding science education in Africa. Dr. Corsaga has entitled her presentation, the, Necess the Necessity of Science Education for African Youth. Please, Dr. Corsaga. Should I uh, start reading? Uh, Karel, we can't hear you if you're translating into English. Um, oh, I'll try again. Okay. Karel? Karel? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Hmm? Tell him to, to go to the main channel. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, please. You know, do, you me, do you want me to read it in English? Yeah. Okay. Please continue. It's fine. Um, we're having a slight audio difficulty, so I'm, I'm going to dub your video into English myself uh, rather than the translator. But um, uh, please go ahead, Dr. Corsaga. I'm sorry. I'm just pulling. I'm just pulling. My name is Marie Corzaga. I am an astrophysicist and originally from Burkina Faso. My research focuses on the distribution of dark matter and visible matter in galaxies. In simple terms, it must be said that visible matter, that is to say, ordinary matter made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, everything that is observable with our devices, represents only about 5% of the universe. The rest is invisible matter, distributed as follows, 26% dark matter and 68% dark energy. 
Dark matter, with its gravitational force, is used to explain the fact that galaxies remain close to each other, while dark energy causes the universe to expand faster over time. So we cannot speak of understanding the universe if we only know about 5% of its constituents. So to understand our universe, that is to say, to be able to account for its formation and evolution, it is essential to understand what dark matter and dark energy are. If I could hear her, it would. Dark matter, as its name suggests, is something that you cannot see with even the most sophisticated telescopes. So far, no dark matter particles have ever been detected. Nevertheless, we feel its presence, thanks to its impact on gravity. The purpose of my research is to study how dark matter is distributed inside galaxies in order to better understand the formation and evolution of our universe, and therefore the origin of life on Earth. Beyond my research, I am interested in the development side of astronomy in Africa. For this, I work at the Office of Astronomy for Development on a project which consists in using astronomy as a factor of development almost everywhere in the world, but especially in the developing countries, by supporting projects related to education, educational tourism, and so on. Speaking of education, it is important to remember that, according to the African Union, Africa has the youngest population in the world, with more than 40% of its young people under the age of 15, which will produce a demographic explosion in the next 10 years. This population growth has disadvantages, but also advantages. The downside is that if measures are not taken, such as access to quality education for boys and girls, especially in science, these young people, instead of becoming a source of development for the continent, risk rather to be a source of socioeconomic, political instability, and conflicts, which will further plunge the continent into mis misery. However, the advantage of this population growth is that through a well-developed education system, this demographic growth if accompanied by strong measures both on the side of public policies and the private sector, will be a great source of sustainable development at the economic and political level of the continent. For this, it is very important to make significant investments in the field of education with a focus on innovation, science, and technology. It should be noted that today, African graduates mainly graduate from the literary and human sciences fields. STEM students, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, represent only 25% of the workforce on average, according to the World Bank. In addition, women are underrepresented in these areas. Take my case. I am the first woman to obtain a doctorate in astrophysics in Burkina, and even in West Africa. It may sound flattering, but it reveals a rather disturbing diagnosis despite being a light of hope. Indeed, even if the region has a dozen doctorates in this field, there are almost no women among them. Unfortunately, this shows that we are still a long way from achieving gender parity in science, and there is still much to do. This requires a change in mentalities and the accessibility of science to women, especially among the underprivileged. It is not unknown that a career in astrophysics requires a course in physics, which is not obvious for women in our societies, where the majority of people think that the scientific fields are dedicated to men, and that women must go to the literary streams. This has the effect of discouraging women from opting for long studies, especially in the scientific fields, and even if they opt for them, they tend to give up at the first obstacles due to the lack of encouragement. Today, I can say that, if I have that I have broken this barrier at my level, and I would like to take advantage of the privilege to inspire and encourage as many young girls as I can to opt for it. Any way I can hear her? It is true that today there are efforts being made it is true that today there are efforts being made by general governments, several governments, to break these stereotypes with, for example, 
the NEF, the Next Einstein Forum in Rwanda, which is a platform for popularizing science. Ah, and which offers opportunities for students through scholarships of the Network of Women in Science called OWSD, the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World, which gives opportunities to girls and women in STEM fields. However, there is still a lot to do because the representation of women in science is far from being reached. Beyond research, I intend to contribute to the training of young people in science in Burkina Faso and in Africa in general by giving courses at universities and also supervising masters and PhD students. I also plan to take action to popularize science education in general and astrophysics in particular in countries where access to science is limited. This will serve to motivate young girls and boys, especially young girls, to take up scientific studies. There are also other future actions that I plan to undertake in collaboration with other researchers, namely the establishment of scientific schools in Africa, particularly dedicated to women, the organization of workshops to enable female scientists to speak about their inspiring work and cultivate self-confidence. The creation of an astronomy club for children, etc. In addition to being fascinating as a science, astronomy can also be used as a development tool through, for example, education and tourism. The International Astronomical Union understands this and is making a lot of effort to address this development component in developing countries and working to achieve the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. The typical example in sub-Saharan Africa is the case of South Africa, where the installation of telescopes in localities has not only facilitated the popularization of science and the creation of jobs for young people, but also has boosted the economy and the development of infrastructure in these localities. The current context in which we are, notably the COVID-19 pandemic, reminds us of how important science must occupy our lives and our education system. This importance must convince the African authorities that it is more than necessary to devote a large part of national budgets to the support and the promotion of studies and of scientific research, because investment in human capital remains a secure means for the growth of a country. Above all, we must understand that to get our continent out of underdevelopment, we will have to review our way of executing these programs, focusing on education, training in science, technology, and innovation, especially space science, could not only increase our human potential, which is a source of sustainable development, but also enable the management of our natural resources and thus impact the economy in the continent. Africa has an immense amount of natural resources essential for the development of industry. It is necessary to arrive at a point where these resources are exploited first for its development by women and men trained on the continent and with compatible techniques. Thank you for offering me the opportunity to share my thoughts on the necessity of education for science in Africa. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Corsaga. I'm sorry we had a little bit of trouble, um, but <laughs> thank you. We will be uh, taking questions for Dr. Corsaga um, after uh, they'll be, send your questions and now we will be taking them in uh, a short moment. Our next speaker is Senator Joe Panaccio. He has served in the New Jersey State Senate since 2008 
and previously served in the state's General Assembly from 2001 to 2008. Senator Panaccio has a far-reaching vision, and he has been an outspoken advocate for nuclear fusion energy. The senator sponsored a hearing in the New Jersey State Legislature in May entitled, What are the Prospects and Requirements for the Early Development of Fusion Energy? And what are the implications for the United States, the state of New Jersey, and the world? This hearing pulled together several leading scientists from the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, as well as from several New Jersey technical corporations that are working on fusion, including in collaboration with the ITER project in France. A link to the video of the hearing that Senator Panaccio held will be included on the conference webpage. It's not there right now if you're watching live, but it will be included. Following that hearing, the senator introduced six related bills to support and attract businesses on fusion, to call on the federal government to offer greater support for this necessary new technology, and one which passed the Senate this February finances research positions for fusion energy and plasma physics as part of this effort. In an introduction to the hearing, he said that with the estimate that we could have sustainable fusion by 2025 and commercial applications by 2050, he said, in my opinion, that is not soon enough. The problems that we have, he concluded, for instance, in space travel, we have to get a new propulsion system that can overcome those challenges. One, that, one of the ways to allow intergalactic and interplanetary travel in the future. Imagine the benefits that men and women can reap from its development. Us legislators, we need to know how we can help that, how we can nurture and help this game changer come into being. So let's hear from New Jersey State Senator Joe Panaccio, serving New Jersey's 26th Senate District. I'm New Jersey State Senator Joseph Panaccio. At the hearing, uh, at the close of your hearing, there was a group of high school students there who had attended, as well as people from the universities. And uh, you said that the development of fusion would, the reason, you said that the hearing was for them as much as for anybody, and that the development of fusion would fundamentally change their lives. Uh, what is your vision for the next 50 years for those young people, the next two generations, if we achieve fusion, if we get a commitment to actually achieve fusion today? Well, I, I don't know if the word is if. Uh, from what I've been reading, it's not if, but when. Uh, actually, they, they've actually set out parameters and dates within the, the five years, 2025, they will actually have a sustainable fusion reaction. And then 25 years after that, they think they can have the first commercial application of fusion. Uh, I think that more or less parallels what happened with nuclear fission uh, and the application and the development of that. Um, I would hope that if we put a concerted effort into it, if we share our knowledge with, with, with knowledge that's going on around the world, especially with the Tokamak reactor and all the countries that have signed on to that uh, portion, uh, I would hope that we get sooner than that. And it is, it's as much their future as it is for mine. I, I'm 65 years old. The, my future is, is not measured in too many decades, uh, if God willing. But their future is measured in an awful lot more decades than I am. So uh, again, imagine a clean, safe, renewable energy source where we don't have to go to war with each other to, to get it, okay? And we don't have to worry about breathing in some of the, uh, some of the gases uh, which may be harmful uh, in the production of those energies. Well, the, the, uh, the idea that you had put forward also that uh, you said in the hearing that Politicians always think they're responsible for the good things, but your position is that actually it's scientists who have changed history. Uh, I'd like to ask you to, to talk about that and also the influence of the, uh, the ideas of, of the American Revolution, which was very committed to science from Ben Franklin on, Ben Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and then of course uh, someone whose picture is all over your office, Abraham Lincoln. So I'd like you to comment on that, on the question of the American system, the commitment to science, and the relationship between political leadership and scientific advance. What is the responsibility of politicians to advance that? And what is the role of the citizens 
to make sure that that is done? Well, it, it, the, um, the evolution of our lives, the fact that they've gotten better, has been through science. It wasn't politicians that got rid of cholera and typhoid and smallpox and polio. It was, it was science. It wasn't uh, uh, politicians that got us to the moon. Uh, it was science. Uh, but it was politicians that challenged us, okay, and that uh, redirected some of those resources. That way, we can go to the moon. We can fight off these infectious diseases. We can improve and lift the spirits of all Americans and all humankind. So my job as a, as a politician is to form public policy and to act as a catalyst for some of those good things that science can do. Uh, and uh, a part of that process is economic, of course, and we think that uh, by uh, generating that enthusiasm and confusion, we could also cultivate a, a resource in the state that we haven't seen since Princeton first got themselves involved with fusion. So uh, it's, a, it's a win, win, win for all those uh, around us, okay? Uh, for some reason, we abrogated that responsibility to Paris and, and their, uh, and their uh, token reactor, okay? And being the selfish New Jersey politician that I am, I'd like to see us get it back. The good news is that as with uh, the Tokamak reactor and the, uh, the inter International uh, Thermonuclear uh, uh, Experimental Reactor and the, the consortium that it put together, I would hope all of this material, all this science is shared in real time. That way we can push this forward and make it a reality for those children that were attending that meeting that day, Susan. Okay, wonderful. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you to the uh, thank you to Senator Panaccio. So um, now, what I'd like to do is pose to Marie Corzaga uh, two questions that are related to your presentation. Um, the first one comes from Ahmed Mustafa. He is the director of the Asia Center for Studies and Translation in Dakar, Senegal. He asks, "How should we reconsider the current educational?" pedagogic systems worldwide, according to this pandemic? What lessons must be realized? One other question. Uh, this comes from Benoit Duteau from France. Benoit asks, how can we in Africa use the coronavirus pandemic to develop nuclear energy, infrastructure, and industry in the next decade? So the questions are about changes in the educational system and pedagogical technique, um, as well as how to use the current problem as an opportunity to create growth in Africa. And I'd like to ask Dr. Corzaga, because we might be having some troubles with our translation facilities, if she could respond um, slowly to the response to the question. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Dr. Korzaga. Oh, vous n'avez pas entendu? Ah, il uh, y a deux questions. La première, c'est de comment il faut changer la méthode pédagogique um, pour l'éducation, pour le vraiment améliorer. Et le, la seconde question, c'est de comment on peut, en Afrique, utiliser, euh, se servir du, euh, du crise euh, de coronavirus pour développer l'énergie nucléaire, l'infrastructure, l'industrie et tout ça. Um, comment utiliser le, le crise pour faire sauter à un autre niveau Thank you. To respond to the first question. I would say that to improve the quality of education, we, we must improve the African laboratories, scientific af laboratories. Theoretical studies are more common due to a lack of material supplies, and this must be rectified. Right. 
we must also encourage students and provide them opportunities to be able to really extend their education and fulfill it to a higher level. We, we must also include facilities and tools to help women pursue their studies and feel more comfortable in the educational environment. On the second question about the coronavirus pandemic, We, we don't yet have full scientific abilities to deal with the coronavirus, and in their lack, we are relying on governmental techniques, such as staying at home, washing your hands, or disinfecting them. Scientists are performing studies. They're simulating the reaction of the virus with different drugs they're considering. They're studying the propagation of the virus with methods of, of modeling. Hmm. Okay, and then uh, she'll be available for more questions later. Thank you, Dr. Korzaga. <laughs> You're welcome, she says. Um, okay, our uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Will Happer. He has a long and distinguished scientific career. He is the Princeton University, he is a Princeton University Professor of Physics Emeritus. Will Happer received his physics PhD at Princeton and began his career at Columbia University, where he became the director of the Columbia Radiation Laboratory before joining the physics faculty at Princeton in 1980. In 1991, he was appointed by the president to serve as the director of, the, of energy research in the Department of Energy, in which position he oversaw a research budget of around $3 billion annually, which included much of the federal funding for high energy and nuclear physics, material science, magnetic confinement fusion, environmental and climate science, the Human Genome Project, and other areas. He then returned to Princeton as a physics professor until his retirement in 2014. From September 2018 to September 2019, Dr. Happer again served as an appointment by the president. He was the deputy assistant to the president and senior director of emerging technologies on the National Security Council. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers, and um, he's, uh, he's happy to, to speak with us next. Let's hear from Professor Will Happer, physics professor emeritus at Princeton University. Will Happer, and I'm a uh, retired professor of physics at Princeton University, where I worked for many years, and uh, I still have an office there, thanks to the trustees at Princeton University. Um, before that, I spent many years in New York City at Columbia University in my youth, and uh, both of my children were born there. Uh, I'm uh, trained in nuclear physics and uh, atomic physics. Uh, I've done a lot of work on laser physics. 
I'm probably best known for inventing the uh, sodium guide star, which uh, most modern telescopes use to uh, uh, compensate for atmospheric turbulence so you can uh, get better resolution of galaxies and other astronomical objects. Uh, my uh, career has been a mixture of theory and experiment. I've done a lot of experiments. Uh, I spent a good fraction of my time working on spin polarized uh, gases, uh, spin polarized nuclei, and uh, one result of that was that we learned to polarize helium-3 and xenon-129 in such large quantities that there was enough that you could breathe them and then you could look at people's lungs with magnetic resonance imaging machines that was impossible before. And so that's developed into an interesting uh, uh, diagnostic technique in medicine. Uh, it's still going on today. We, we actually did a little startup company based on that and so the, which was successful and uh, help to launch the careers of uh, some of our former students and postdocs. So I guess uh, I would say I'm a classical uh, uh, physics nerd. You know, I like physics. I like quantitative things. I, I like things that you can model, but <laughs> I want them to be uh, models that can be believed. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's uh, not a very complicated idea. Almost any other important science or technology uh, effort of our country uh, has been carefully reviewed, uh, especially in defense. For example, before we buy something, we have a, what's called a red team review, uh, where people intentionally try to poke holes in, say, this weapon system or this theory or that. and. Uh, then the proponents have to defend it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, often they get through or they, uh, w with, you know, A plus certification. I defended, you know, what I'm trying to do. You mm -hmm. know, these people did their best. They couldn't poke any holes in it. So I'm mm -hmm. stronger than when I started. And so if climate is really so good, why, why are they afraid, you know, to stand up? you know, and defend what they're doing, to be questioned, to answer questions. Everyone else has to do that. Why are they different? So anyway, they, uh, it was, uh, they were absolutely outraged to think that anyone would like to uh, audit what they were doing. Uh, everybody else gets audited, but they're free from audits, you know. They, mm. uh, and so, you know, it was a political issue. They called in all of their friends in the Senate, you know, and all, all across America, you know, how dare, you know, this evil Trump administration question us. We're the greatest scientists who've ever lived on the planet, you know, and we're saving the planet. And here these guys are trying to ask us about how we calibrate this uh, thermometer, you know, how dare they do that, you know. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was sort of the situation. And, you know, I think the president understood, but uh, and there were many, many other issues at the time, and it just didn't seem like this was the right one to pick up. Uh, and he was probably right. What, what it tells you is that scientists always have to be very self-critical. You know, you should always be questioning yourself. You should be questioning your colleagues, uh, you know, have you thought about this? Have you, you know, could it have been caused by this rather than what you claim it's caused by? And that's what does not happen in climate. You know, climate uh, is completely impervious to criticism. You cannot criticize it. You know, it's, it's like you know, design, denying some religious uh, uh, belief. In, in fact, it's interesting, the language that they use is all religious, you know. You're denying climate. Mm. Well, what, what does deny mean? <laughs> you know, why, why, why are you using that word in connection with uh, a scientific field? You know, so it has all the trappings of a religious cult, and that's what it has become for many people. There are exceptions who are, they're honest climate scientists, but they're uh, uh, deluded by many uh, cultists. Well, 
a lot of people don't realize how important accidents have been in the development of uh, technology uh, and science. Uh, you know, uh, politicians think that, you know, we will set up a big program, we'll spend a lot of money and we, we'll have a war on cancer and we'll cure cancer. I remember when that happened, that was back in the 70s, you know, and uh, we spent a lot of money and cancer's still here, you know, mm -hmm. we made a little progress, thank goodness. But uh, that's not the way that you, you solve a really hard problem. It's usually solved because of some accidental discovery. Take nuclear uh, energy, for example, fission energy. Uh, uh, it was obvious there was a lot of energy involved in nuclear transformation from the first discovery of the nucleus uh, by Ernest Rutherford. And when Rutherford was asked, are you ever going to get power? He says, anyone who says you're going to get a power out of nuclear physics, they're talking moonshine. I think that was the word he used, moonshine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was right because at the time no one knew there was a, such a thing as a neutron. But a few years after he had made this statement, the neutron was discovered accidentally. You know, they thought at first that it was some odd gamma ray, penetrating gamma ray. So it took a long time to realize that this was a new elementary particle that was not charged and so could easily interact with nuclei. There was no Coulomb force to keep it out. So that was the first accident. And then Enrico Fermi was very uh, uh, quick to use the neutron for studies of uh, nuclear physics. And he and his team in Rome did lots of exciting work uh, uh, in those first few years, he got the Nobel Prize for making what he thought were transuranic elements. He deserved a Nobel Prize. He was such a good guy, but it was a mistake. You know, what he was really doing was causing fission of uranium. And it wasn't until Lisa Meitner and her team in Berlin uh, started doing chemistry on this irradiated uranium. They realized that it's not transuranics at all. It's barium and <laughs> intermediate, you know, weight nuclei that have been formed with the uranium nucleus splits. Again, an accident. And so mm -hmm. those two accidents, the accidental discovery of the neutron and the accidental discovery of fission, made, you know, uh, nuclear power possible, you know, not only weapons, but uh, civilian power too. That has not happened for uh, fusion, you know, I think it may happen, you know, somebody will make an accidental discovery, which will make a, what seems like a very, very difficult engineering problem right now, suddenly feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I'm all for supporting work on fusion, but uh, you have to be realistic that uh, it, it won't help to increase the budget by a factor of 10 if you don't have a good new idea. <laughs> Well, of course, uh, satellites have been very important for uh, climate science because we have uh, the best data available now uh, from satellite measurements of atmospheric temperatures, satellite measurements of cloudiness, satellite measurements of the radiation budget of the Earth. All of that's good stuff, and I'm 100% for that. You know, that's a part of climate science that we can be proud of. And uh, I think it doesn't get enough support. Uh, of course, that's focused on the Earth, not on other planets, but uh, the way other planet climate systems work is interesting too. You know, Venus is quite mm -hmm. different from Earth. Uh, most of that is because it's quite a bit closer to the sun, so it gets twice as much uh, insulation as Earth does. It's uh, uh, but they're interesting systems on, on the outer planets. Jupiter has an amazing climate system, you know, clouds, the, the great red spot. So they're the very rich uh, uh, set of targets out there for bright young people to work on, for NASA's uh, exploration satellites to help with, you know. Uh, so all of that's very good stuff. I, I think if you ask what is the fundamental uh, question out there, it's really uh, 
dark matter. You know, there's uh, this huge part of the matter in the universe that nobody knows what it is. And it's obviously there, you know, from uh, not very subtle uh, experimental observations, you know, how fast galaxies rotate about their center. They rotate much too fast because of some of this missing mass, the dark matter. And then there's the dark energy. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the fundamental frontiers. And there too, I think that this is probably a uh, puzzle that will ha be solved by a lucky accident. You know, we should do our best to design experiments, but, you know, keep our eyes open for accidents. I think that's how it will be cracked. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't talk about space, I think the other huge uh, area, if I were a young person, I would look very carefully at uh, biology, biophysics, biochemistry, there, uh, we, we see just in the case of COVID, you know, you know, if we were a little more nimble, you know, we could have had a, uh, a vaccine or an antidote, you know, and I would guess uh, the time will come when we will be able to respond to new viruses very, very quickly and, and nip them in the bud. We can't do that today, but that's certainly something that I believe could be done in the future, but it won't happen, you know, automatically. People need to work on it. There have to be accidents happening. Uh, there, uh, there too, there have been accidents. I, I think many of your listeners may know about the, the CRISPR revolution. It was, again, an accident in biology that uh, uh, discovered this uh, CRISPR mechanism for... Uh, gene editing, uh, but uh, it was because some smart people uh, looked at data and realized um, there's something funny about this. It doesn't fit the usual paradigm and they worked it out. So I, I think there's plenty of room for smart young people who are willing to work hard to make a big difference to human, uh, uh, the human condition uh, and to have a good time doing it, you know, solving problems. So that was Professor Will Happer, Professor of Physics Emeritus from Princeton University. Um, if, like me, you found several of the things he said surprising or you'd like to ask him about them, please send in your questions, questions at schillerinstitute.org. Uh, Professor Happer will be available for the Q&A uh, shortly, as are Ben Denniston, Megan Beats, and Marie Corsaga. Our next presentations, before we get into that Q&A, are about the treatments of COVID, and we're going to be hearing from two, uh, two physicians who are involved in this. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Kildare Clark, who is a physician practicing in New York City, about what the situation is like at what is currently ground zero for the coronavirus. I'm Kildare Clark. I've been a doctor for many, many years, too many to even remember. However, I got very involved with the Lyndon LaRouche group, which was a very important thing for me to do at that point in time. Due to the fact they were looking at the injustice which goes on in healthcare delivery and the closing of various hospitals turning over those space to private entities at the expense of the patients which we were taking care of. We warned them back then, and with many protests, many demonstrations, even down to the Washington DC General Hospital where Dennis, myself, Lenin LaRouche, and many of the followers went to protest the closing of that hospital. Despite our loss, because they did close the hospital, we have never given up on the mission because healthcare is the number one national product of the world. Just to give you an example, if every 
person in this world is sick, nothing moves. So therefore, our national product is the health care of everyone. And that's where our focus must always go first before we can think about other things. Anyhow, the powers to be think it is best for them to look at healthcare and it's a numbers game, like widgets which you play on Wall Street. But people's life are not widgets. They're human beings. Without them, there is no world. And it is incumbent upon us as healthcare providers to make that message go through loud and clear. We might have to give up a lot. We might be fired from our jobs. We might be thrown in prison. But it's a cause which is so indelible in my mind that we must do it and do it for the good of society. It's not a personal thing. It's for the good of society. I think Dr. Clark put the moral terms of the necessity for a world health system very clearly in what he just said. Our next and final speaker for this panel is Dr. Guangxi Li. And the Schiller Institute would like to thank the CGT and Think Tank in helping to make Dr. Li available. Dr. Li is an MD PhD at the China Academy of Physical, excuse me, of Medical Sciences in Beijing, and he's with the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. His most recent paper, published on April 11th in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, is Association Between Hypoxia, excuse me, Hypoxemia and Mortality in Patients with COVID-19. He will speak to us today about an aspect of the Chinese experience in responding to COVID-19 with a talk he has entitled, Preventing Acute Lung Injury, Essentials of COVID-19 Treatment. Dr. Guangxi Li, following which we will be able to have a Q&A with all of the panelists um, that I'd mentioned before. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Guang Xi Li. Uh, I'm from uh, China Academy of Chinese Medical Science. And today, uh, my topic will focus on the uh, Chinese medicine treatment on COVID-19. So we all know the COVID-19 outbreak uh, since uh, the, the, this year, uh, January. And it's bright uh, right now, it's bright all over the world. I mean, uh, it's a, certainly a pandemic uh, for the human. Uh, and we are fighting the COVID-19 uh, with a different approach. But in China, we do have the traditional Chinese medicine theory. And from the history of Chinese medicine, uh, we are fighting different kinds of uh, virus and pandemic. Uh, using only herbs, so it's really, really effective. And we had quite a lot of experience on that. So today I would like to share uh, some of our successful case. And we also have some data, and we are going to publish this uh, data soon. Uh, so uh, let me share the screen first. So, so the, the topic today is uh, preventing acute lung injury essential, essentials of COVID-19 treatment. So as we all know, uh, most patients who suffer from the COVID-19 uh, will have very mild mild symptoms. Even they don't have any symptoms. They are asymptomatic patients. Uh, in, in terms of our experience, there are several stages. So the first stage is the incubation period. So that's about uh, one to 14 days. The second in, uh, uh, week 
of the disease is the most important window for us to prevent the cure of injury. So that's a fever period. So that's a, from day one to day seven. So basically, it's the first week of the disease onset. So the patient usually have a, a mild fever to a severe fever. Uh, so it's from 37.5 Celsius to um, over 39.5. So some patients may only you know, have some kind of very mild, uh, mild fever, and then they stop on that time. But the other patients may they develop a quite long, quite severe uh, fever. So, and then the second, uh, the third stage is a uh, acute lung injury period. So, if we cannot uh, treat the fever, then the patients may develop acute lung injury, uh, even ARDS. Then we need uh, some kind of a respiratory support, especially we need to intubate patients. Uh, and later on, if the patient can overcome this difficult stage and uh, they will come to the recurring period. So that's uh, sec after uh, two weeks. So basically, this is the whole map of the treatment uh, using Chinese medicine. So we, what we need to do is we need to do it a little early. Um, there are several uh, indications for the uh, uh, severe cases. So here, the high temperature increase and the dry cough increase, and the patient develop dyspnea, and that means the patient may, is on the road of a lung injury. So that's a very dangerous uh, indicator. So that's what we need to do. So we need to treat patients early instead of too late. If they once we start, the patient already develop uh, a lung injury, then we treat them. That's really a very long. Uh, treatment period, so the mortality will be high. So the good stuff, the best, uh, if we want to get some good outcome, we need to intervene uh, very early stage. So the very early stage is what we need to do. Also, well, we need to control transmission. So test, test, test. So now we can find out who have the virus and then we isolate the patients. That's what we have done. So the fever window uh, is uh, very, very important, like, like what I said before. So right now, we don't have any confirmed any uh, antiviral drug really work on these patients. So if the fever is you know, persistent, uh, the patients may develop a very severe uh, and the falling off the cliff. So the best way what we've seen is the Chinese medicine. So regarding the Chinese medicine, uh, we actually, we don't want to kill the virus from the Chinese philosophy. We want to regulate our immune response to the uh, virus, to adapt the virus. Basically, the virus actually can be killed by ourselves. Uh, the major uh, reason why the patients die, because they de develop very strong uh, cytokine storm, and then the the cytokine storm will kill us. So that's what we used. Here is a, a formula of what we use for the patients. So basically, the first important medication is the ginseng. So using the current Western medicine, we tested that ginseng really could help us to decrease the cytokine storm and regulate our cells to adapt to the the new virus. And then we monitor the patient's fever progression, we monitor oxygen saturation, uh, monitor cough for the shortness of breath so we could prevent the cure and injury. So if the, we could not cure the patients at the early stage, the patient may develop ARDS, then we need some kind of uh, ventilator, even ECMO. So here, there are some kind of uh, there are some, some kind of the, the cases I would like to discuss. Here is a patient, uh, seven, uh, 76 uh, years old. He had fever in about two days. And you can see uh, the, here the CT scan. 
and you can see the my, the moderate amount to moderate uh, bilateral long infiltrate. So you see here. So it's quite severe. And we use a uh, medicine and to to treat him. And then you see four days later we had another CT scan, and the patient uh, got better. Symptom got much better. Here is the, the another CT scan for him. And then we noticed that this disease is quite different uh, from the is, is from the uh, is quite different uh, from the other pneumonia. So it can the the I think the if you, uh, infiltrate could be could disappear in a very short period of time if we treat patients on time. So the patients, uh, you know, even he had quite a lot of morbidities and other you know, complications, but he still recovered you know, about one week. Uh, he don't get any uh, Western medicine treatment, and no antiviral drug, no antibiotics. So there is uh, some other cases I I will not discuss too much. And um, here, the patients, if the fever persistent, maybe after a week, the patient can start to have the uh, develop acute lung injury. So here is another case I would like to discuss. The patients uh, who is a marathon run runner, and after uh, he got the acute lung injury, and you can see the bilateral infiltrate, and we use the Chinese method, stop the fever, and the patients, uh, you know, got recovered uh, after Chinese method, but it doesn't work for the Western method. So, like this case, the patients really have the acute lung injury. If he already developed a client, then how we treat them? So this is a, another case. So once the patients have the acute injury, he was on the uh, FIO2 is about 65, and his uh, saturation only 81. So it's obvious, very severe acute injury. And what we did is we used Chinese medicine, and we also used some kind of clapping and the expression. So this stuff to stop the coughing. Then the patients recovered after one week Chinese medicine treatment. And you can see the CT sky is very severe. Almost 90% uh, of his uh, lung uh, was infiltrated, uh, was damaged. So the, the basic stuff I want to summarize is uh, uh, the mechanism of this uh, COVID-19 is a development of acute lung injury. So if the patient don't have a lung injury, that's a mild thing. So the only patients we need to treat is who develop uh, acute lung injury. You can see this uh, uh, mass figure from the New Journal Medicine so talking about the lung injury. The right side is um, abnormal alveolar after the attack of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, obviously, you can see uh, those patients uh, the the uh, alveolar was broken and we had quite a lot of infusions and there's flooding, so it's very severe. So then we need to treat the patients uh, uh, at early stage. So that's why we use the Chinese medicine to stop the fever and stop the inflammation and stop the cough. After that, we still need maybe some patients, we still need the oxygen support and the respiratory support. And we, we should not use any antiviral drugs and antibiotic. So that's what I'm talking. Thank you. Uh, I would like to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. So thank you to Dr. Lee. Um, we are now at our discussion period, and we've got a, a fair amount of time available. I don't know if that's true for all speakers, but uh, currently available for questions are um, myself, Ben Denniston, Megan Beats, Marie Corzaga, and uh, I believe Professor Happer has been connected as well. Uh, well, Happer, are you uh, are you there? Okay, he's he's being connected. Um, hello. Okay. So. Um, 
Okay. Well, while Dr. Happer is being connected, I'll just make one more announcement about the uh, Lyndon LaRouche Collected Works, Volume 1, which is available at the LaRouche Legacy Foundation.org. And I see Professor Happer is with us. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Hi there. Hi. So we're just uh, going to try that again. We're going to get the audio up. Could you speak again, Professor Happer? Can, okay. can you hear me now? Yes, yes, now I can. Okay, great. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, good. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, we have <laughs> several questions came in for you based on, the, uh, based on the speech that you gave. And so I'd like to sort of combine a couple of them um, and maybe just chat for a minute. Well, one of the things that you brought up in your talk was about the role of accidents in making discoveries, even if you weren't really intending to, that they sort of come up. You had said at the end of your talk that it might be possible one day to be able to rapidly react to a virus that arises, be able to create you know, antibodies or antidotes quickly, but that making that breakthrough might require a fortunate accident. So I, I was wondering if you could say more about the role of accident in, uh, in scientific uh, discovery and also the apparent contrast between uh, the ability to have a science driver program, like when Kennedy said, we're going to the moon, um, how do you see the relationship between having a crash program to really try and make a scientific discovery versus the serendipitous nature that some of them take? Well, uh, thank you. There, you can have focused uh, research programs and they can do some good. Uh, but uh, the really big breakthroughs uh, historically have usually been some accident or another. For, for example, uh, discovery of x-rays was a complete accident. Rentkin was uh, uh, perceptive enough to recognize something strange was happening in his laboratory. And uh, he worked hard and he turned it into, you know, modern x-ray technology. Um, uh, it was an accident uh, that fission was discovered. Nobody predicted fission. It was uh, thanks to Lisa Meitner and uh, uh, Han that when they tried to repeat Enrico Fermi's experiments of uh, transuranics uh, and did some chemistry on it, they did not find what they thought should be there. They thought there should be neptunium and plutonium transuranics. That's what uh, Fermi got the Nobel Prize for, but in fact, that wasn't what he was doing. He was splitting the nucleus, and uh, Meitner and Hahn were smart enough to uh, to demonstrate that, you know, the radioactivity is really associated with barium, not with plutonium. So there, uh, there are many cases like that where the, the uh, initial breakthrough is just completely unexpected. Uh, uh, the other extreme of that is uh, take something like the semiconductor industry, you know, Moore's Law. That has been systematic investment in better and better equipment, you know, higher resolution, photolithography, you know, better photoresist, uh, you know, better control of equipment. That also works. Uh, but uh, it's you know, it, it's a different type of scientific progress than the uh, the type that I think will be necessary, for example, to uh, solve the controlled fusion problem. I think that will be just solved by an accident. Another example of that, it's not uh, practical, but uh, I think you know that the low-hanging fruit in physics and cosmology today is what is the nature of dark matter? You know, what is it that makes galaxies rotate a lot faster than they really should be rotating. And people have, are desperately trying to figure out what it could be, You're trying to build detectors that would detect weakly interacting particles uh, here to unimagined. Uh, this again, I think will be a, a problem that will be solved by a lucky accident and, and some perceptive person who can tell the difference between an important accident and just the usual mistakes that are made in experiments. I hope that's enough. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, another one of the uh, the panelists from this discussion would also like to ask you a question. Ben, are you there? I'm here, yes. Okay. Ben Denniston, please. Hi, Jason. Hi. I can be heard okay? Go right ahead. Yes, I hear you fine. Great. Uh, glad to be here with all, all, all the guests we've had and glad to speak to you, Mr. Mr. Happer. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, uh, Professor Happer, you, you've, you've discussed and other people have discussed the benefits of higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and I found that to be some fascinating areas of science to look at, just how our biosphere responds uh, to some of these things. And when I've discussed that with other people, what I find is that there seems to be a more of a gut reaction, even from, from scientists, about that doesn't seem to fit a certain narrative. Um, and, and oftentimes, in the most fundamental sense, there tends to be this narrative that human activity is inherently problematic for the planet. Um, and human activity inherently causes problems and catastrophes and you know, any idea that it could be good just kind of doesn't fit this perspective. Um, and people tend to think about science as uh, objective, fact-based, kind of like a cold, just follow the facts process, when in reality it seems that we have these kind of narratives and dogmas that do play a substantial role in affecting where science goes and doesn't go and what areas of science which could be incredibly beneficial um, and interesting, including various factors of natural causes of climate change, um, are actually affected by this. So I, you know, definitely appreciate your any thoughts you have on that reality of this social aspect and these narratives in science and the effect that has and where we can go to to get past some of that. Well, I think science has always been uh, much more. Uh, subjective than uh, scientists would like you to think. You know, people have been disputing science since, uh, you know, Galileo <laughs> and long before uh, over the nature of this aspect of science or that. Uh, and um, the idea that scientists are somehow different from other human beings who have prejudices and uh, uh, who have infatuations and are mistaken frequently, uh, that's just not true. Scientists have all those faults. And it's been demonstrated generation after generation. Uh, you know, an example is uh, continental drift. You, you remember that uh, this was originally proposed by uh, a very uh, uh, good, very bright German, uh, but he was not trained in geology. Uh, so his uh, uh, his ideas, I, I, I'm trying, I have a block, I, was it Begner? Anyway, who, whoever it was, uh, was an excellent scientist and uh, he was just uh, dismissed uh, out of hand, especially by American geologists. They, and I remember even when I was a graduate student in the uh, early 60s, he was still being dismissed. But he was right. He was completely right. And uh, uh, now nobody uh, would even think to uh, question continental drift. It's a, it's a real fact. But it wasn't easy for the, uh, uh, for the uh, first proposers and, and the first... Uh, disciples who uh, make headway. You didn't get tenure, for example, if you believed in continental drift in, in the 1950s. Uh, so uh, coming back to your question, uh, you know, people don't like to admit that CO2 is a benefit to the world. It actually clearly is. I mean, the geological history is completely clear. And I think the uh, most compelling thing is that if you go to greenhouse operators, uh, they routinely uh, double, triple, quadruple the amount of CO2 in their greenhouses, and not because they're involved in a debate over climate, because they want to make money. And if you grow cucumbers or if you grow, you know, decorative flowers in a greenhouse with more CO2, you get a better product and you get a better price. You have to pay for the CO2. It's not cheap but it, it's a good investment. And so here we're getting this uh, free CO2 that's enriching the entire planet. And we should be, be very grateful for that. Uh, 
but of course it doesn't fit the narrative and uh, <laughs> what can I say it's the human condition great so uh, <laughs> you know dr. Happer in your um, in your, your short talk here you, you'd mentioned uh, dark matter another speaker that we have on the panel who's not appearing on the screen right now but we have with us uh, Marie Corsaga um, she recently received her doctorate in astrophysics looking at dark matter. And I'd like to pose a question to her and then um, return to ask you a question, Professor Happer. So, um, for, uh, oh, is the, is it work, is the translation? Okay, Dr. Corzago will answer this one in English, I believe. So, um, the question is from Yugbare Bubakar who asks that since gender divisions and enrollments are more pronounced in STEM than they are in other areas of education, what can be done by African states to encourage girls to study space sciences? And congratulations for setting the ground for future girls to study astrophysics. Is that a question for Will or? or who is that a question for? <laughs> That's a question for Marie Corzaga, who will respond to it. And then we have another question for you, Will Happer. Okay. Okay. To answer to this question, I'm not really an expert to the topic, but my opinion is that girls need to be inspired from the young age. And for that, uh, they need the role models that why it is important to encourage girls and women to pursue scientific studies by allowing them uh, to have more access to science. For example, during the uh, a meeting organization for meetings and workshops. And also what I would like to say is to, more, to um, more build more scientific schools for girls to have access and give them opportunities like fellowship to pursue in uh, STEM studies. And uh, what I would also like to say is uh, maybe if the government give more opportunity, act open more, uh, I, I can say to, uh, to vulgarize sense like uh, making interaction between girls and women who already have uh, the, have a sense uh, background so they can uh, see that from them like a role people and then they will be inspired to continue and pursue scientific studies thank you dr Krizaga. Uh, I'd like to pose a question to, uh, to Will Happer now. Um, Professor Happer, the, um, oops, I just blanked out for a second. Oh yeah, there it is. So uh, <laughs> Professor Happer, one of the earlier speakers on this panel who is um, not able to join us for the Q&A, he, he's in France, uh, uh, Dr. Jean-Pierre Luminet, who is a uh, astrophysicist, he, in his presentation, had contrasted the necessity for free invention, and he used quotations from Einstein about this. He spoke about the method of Johannes Kepler, and he contrasted the role of free invention in being able to actually, you know, create concepts to improve our understanding of physics. He contrasted that with the too strict implementation of what's called the scientific method. Um, which he believes is too formal, really, to, to bear the greatest kinds of fruit. Do you have a response to this distinction that uh, Jean-Pierre Luminet had laid out in his talk? Oh, sorry. Could uh, Professor Happer, could you start over again? You, you were muted. I'm sorry. But we can hear you now. Go right ahead. Okay, well, uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't hear the talk because I had some trouble signing in. I, it finally got worked out. <laughs> but I agree with what you described, you know, that uh, the scientific method uh, is often a straitjacket that hinders progress. And uh, it, it certainly hinders these accidental discoveries if you take it too literally. 
uh, it is important to eventually to make sure that this brilliant idea you think you've had, it, it really is a brilliant idea. You know, and most people I know have lots of brilliant ideas of which maybe, you know, one in 10 really is brilliant, you know. <laughs> and so it takes a little while to, uh, to sort out which ones uh, really are important. Uh, but but they don't they don't come from uh, uh, following some textbook. They they come sort of God knows where. But but uh, they come to prepared minds. People are uh, are prepared to recognize some important new idea. Good, thank you. I'd like to ask one more to Dr. Quizaga if she is still connected. We have Dr. Corzaga. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Here is the um, the question that came in from um, someone in New York. He says the great historian and physicist Sheikh Anta Diop wrote in his 1978 short book on Africa that advanced energy technologies such as thermonuclear fusion must be pursued in African nations and astronomical observatories and elements of space exploration are needed to be put online as rapidly as possible to allow African states to enter the 21st century on the same footing as other parts of the world. This did not occur. In what way do you think we must act to encourage, in particular young people, the people that Professor Happer and others expect to make the new breakthroughs, how do we encourage them despite the many hardships that may exist? Okay, thank you for this question. It's an interesting one. Um, what I can say is uh, to encourage them is before we need to uh, create more opportunities. And also we need to uh, let them know the importance of these uh, scientific, scientific program for Africa, for the development of Africa, the impact of this in Africa. And uh, what I wanted to add also is when you take the scientific, the, the space science, the astronomy and other things, they, ha they have, an, even if it's not a, the impact, others impact related to different uh, kind of uh, studies like, Taking, for example, a program for astronomy, uh, to build uh, a program for astronomy, you need to uh, form, to, uh, to develop competence in engineering, mathematics, and uh, physics, and all those skills are use, useful for the development for the, um, for the country. Uh, like in many sectors. So I think they need to uh, give all, all these um, information to young people in Africa to let them know the importance and the, the positive impact of, this, of uh, the scientific studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwesaka. Welcome. Uh, the next question goes to Will Happer, and this is a question that another one of our panelists wanted to ask you. Megan Beats, go right ahead. Hi, Dr. Happer. Uh, earlier in the presentation that Jason, Ben, and I gave, we discussed some of the common threats to the planet, including space weather events like CMEs, asteroid strikes, and so forth. And um, something that I raised as part of my presentation was the fact that our planet is in a galactic system. And uh, what I specifically want to ask you about is the weather system. 
Um, you know, you ha you've had people like Nir Shaviv, Heinrich Svensmark, and others demonstrate that cycles of our solar system's motion through the galaxy and the influence of galactic cosmic rays in the atmosphere play a big role in modulating weather on Earth. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that and also if you have any thoughts on why that outlook is so rejected and resisted today. Well, I'm a big admirer of uh, Hendrik Sinsmark and uh, Nir Shaviv. Uh, uh, they've done absolutely beautiful work, very interesting work. They're still working hard on actual experiments to um, see how uh, cloud nuclei uh, form in the atmosphere in response to cosmic rays. So they don't just uh, make theories, they actually do measurements. And uh, as um, they pointed out, uh, the Earth uh, and the solar system drift in and out of the spiral arms of our galaxy. And so this modulates uh, cosmic ray backgrounds on a long-term basis over you know many tens of millions of years. And there's some evidence that that has played a role in the climate of the Earth if you uh, take these very long periods uh, into account. So uh, if you don't know about their work, I, I do recommend it to you. Uh, Nir Shaviv in particular has written some very uh, accessible summaries of, of the ideas. It's good physics, good astronomy, and uh, uh, they may be right. They may. I don't know whether they're right or not, but it looks better than uh, many of the uh, establishment theories of what is controlling climate, which are clearly, those theories are clearly not working very well. Thank you. Great. Um, so, Dr. Happer, we've got some more questions that have come in from you. We have many questions on many topics. Um, there are about 20 questions about COVID, ranging from implanting microchips when you get a vaccine to digital identity cards to vitamin C to um, masks being bad for you. Um, we are going to leave those aside for now and stick with... Um, and stick with the, some of the topics of the speakers that we have on actually available for the Q&A. We will forward those to the, the two physicians that we heard from earlier to see if they have any responses. The uh, next question that came for you is about uh, sort of a combined topic about uh, national science objectives. So this is sort of three questions put together. One is that uh, Trump has called for international collaboration and in space exploration as the U.S. plans to return to the moon by 2024. U.S.-Soviet cooperation in space science has had a long and productive history. Recently, Putin has outlined a bold plan for multi-nation work to finally realize thermonuclear fusion as an inexhaustible energy source, that says the questioner, and they'd like to know what the pathway is to realize those potentials. I'd like to combine that with another question that came in about, I suppose, the, the social role of, of, uh, of science and of scientists. Another question was about Trump's approach towards science and how it may be related to the work of his, I believe, uncle, who is a uh, uh, Professor John Trump, a great uncle, um, who I believe was at MIT doing work during World War II. If you have any thoughts about, I know those are sort of two different questions there, um, but about the, the cultural aspect of a, a commitment to science and how we could learn from working with others internationally. Well, um, I, I think uh, international collaboration to the extent that it provides career paths for attractive career paths for young people is very good. For example, the Russians did us a big favor by launching Sputnik in the United States because science was languishing until that point. And uh, it woke many people in the US up to realize that there are a lot of smart people all over the world, not just in the United States, not just in Europe. You know, there were smart people in Russia and China, even Africa. and. Uh, so uh, it was time for us to pull up our, our bootstraps and, and start moving again. 
So I think uh, programs like this that uh, inspire young people uh, are important. Programs that give them a, a career path forward, uh, something they can do that gives them some self-respect. And who, you know, I, I'm convinced that we will solve a number of problems because of the young people of the future having smart ideas, good ideas. And uh, these accidents I mentioned before, they, they, they don't have to come to young people, but uh, they often do. Uh, and um, uh, so having some kind of a goal, even if you don't reach the goal, often it doesn't matter because you've uh, discovered something else that you didn't expect to discover. And uh, perhaps the, the type of joint efforts on controlled fusion or on uh, space exploration with other countries uh, will help us to do that. I, I, I'm all in favor of that. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to switch to one more question to Dr. Corzaga. I believe she's still available. Um, we'd like to ask you to give some of your thoughts about how you believe the question of dark matter may be resolved. I know this was the, the topic of your PhD dissertation. Where do you think the future will, will lead us in exploring this phenomenon? Okay, my thought is uh, first to start with dark matter. Now, for the moment, it's an hypothetic matter. We cannot observe this, this matter, but we can feel it through the gravity. So this matter, it's a, knowing more about this matter will help us to understand how galaxies form and evolve with time. But if you take a galaxy, you can notice that the rotation that the galaxy, the, the velocity as a function of the radius, the way it uh, rotates, it's faster compared to the visible matter inside. When I'm talking about the visible matter, I, I'm talking about the, the, the stellar component inside the, the galaxy and also the gas component. So if you, we take this component, we can notice that the rotation, the way the galaxy is rotated, it's more faster, it's quicker compared to uh, the rotation that we can only get when using the visible matter inside. So to understand how the galaxies uh, rotate, we need to, um, to, to, um, to include the dark matter inside to describe how the uh, rotation curve, describe the rotation curve of the galaxies. So knowing this dark matter will help us to understand the distribution and how the quantity of dark matter inside galaxies, and then to understand how the galaxy rotates and to better understand and form the formation and evolution and to better understand the universe. Uh, one interesting thing to also notice is that when we observe a, a galaxy at a certain distance, who is uh, a galaxy far from us, the luminosity that we collect is disturbed by the dark matter. And so uh, this we call this uh, the gravitational lens. And this gravitational lens can help us to, uh, to have a knowledge on the, how the dark matter is distributed and the real quantity of the dark matter inside the universe. So knowing how a universe, it's uh, very, very important to understand the behavior of the dark matter. And when I'm talking about the visible matter inside the universe, it only represents 5%. And the dark matter are five times, um, what to say, have five times abundance compared to the visible matter. So we cannot say that we can understand how our universe 
is forming and in time and uh, evolve if we only know 5% of the constituents. So knowing the dark matter will be an opportunity for us to understand the formation and evolution of the galaxies and also the universe, and then to go back to understand the formation of uh, our planets and the apparition of life in Earth. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, before posing, there are several more questions that came in, one in particular for Professor Happer about his uh, work on developing the guide star approach for adaptive optics. Um, I first wanted to ask Professor Happer if you would like to add anything on, on the topic that Dr. Corsaga just addressed of dark matter before we move on to uh, another one. No, I, I think she, she did a very nice job explaining that it's obvious there's dark matter there because galaxies are rotating too fast if, you know, if you don't assume dark matter. And so the, it, it's clearly there. It, uh, the question is, what is it? Is it little particles? Uh, at one time, people thought maybe it was, uh, you know, dwarf stars that were too small to be seen. There's not much support for that anymore. But it's a wonderful mystery, and uh, it's a big effect. So I, you know, I would love to be the one to discover it. I don't expect to be, but uh, I encourage young people to take that as one of their goals. And I, I do uh, agree with uh, uh, Dr. Corsaga about the importance of role models for uh, young women. It, it's very hard for women in physics and astronomy uh, uh, to. Uh, get started. Uh, at least in the United States, you don't get much support from your peers. You know, if you're a, a young woman in, in middle school or high school and you show an interest in math or science, then uh, people make fun of you. And uh, uh, unless you have tremendous strength of character and you have family support, then uh, you often just give up before you've even had a chance to try something. So. Uh, one of my good friends was uh, Sally Ride, the first um, female astronaut in the United States. I'm sorry, Sally died far too young, but she was a tremendous inspiration to many young uh, women. And I, I hope that she still is. Uh, and uh, I hope that Dr. Corsaga will be an inspiration one of these days to uh, a new generation of young women. So go good luck to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Let's see. Was there a second part of the question? I've forgotten it by now. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, well, we're gonna we're gonna pose it to you, and then I just want to yeah, okay. I want to thank uh, I want to thank Dr. Corzaga. She's joining us from Burkina Faso, and it's getting a little late there, so I don't. She may be getting off now. And uh, I'm just currently like, in, in South Africa. <laughs> oh, you're in South Africa. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's still pretty late, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's later here. So, okay. Yes. Well, we, I just want to thank you for, for joining us. And if you can stay on, that's great. And if not, we wish you a good night and want to thank you for for. Thank for you very much. Uh, if it's okay, I will sign off now. I'm, I'm working oh, on oh, some other things. Oh, oh, Dr. Happer, we were hoping to ask one more of you. I was... Uh, oh, oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we could, well, uh, Ben had a question for you about your, um, your development of the uh, Guide right. Star approach. Ben, could you ask your, uh, your question? Sure. Yeah, definitely appreciate taking the time with. I was just curious if you had any uh, favorite discoveries or areas of investigation that have been dependent on and, and built upon this uh, ability to see through the atmosphere more clearly for astronomy, which your, your guide star system contributed to. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it certainly played a major role in uh, defining the properties of the uh, black hole in the center of our galaxy because it it allowed uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Claire Max and uh, 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 Professor Malkin at UCSD to uh, measure stars that are very, very close to the galactic center with infrared telescopes. And uh, the additional resolution you could get from the uh, use of guide stars was a key part of this. So I'm, I'm pleased that it had that application. Of course, it has applications also in uh, 
laser propagation. If you try to project a lot of laser power through the atmosphere, you if you don't correct for the atmospheric turbulence, uh, you, you just can't get much power onto target. And uh, there it's routinely used also. Uh, so there are, uh, um, there have been uses. It, w it was heavily classified for 10 years, so we couldn't talk about it. But, uh, but again, thanks to Claire Max, it has been uh, declassified since the early 90s and uh, has proved its worth in astronomy. Um, thank you. There is one, I'd like to ask one final question, and Professor Happer, if you want to stay on for it, it's up to you. I'll, I'll pose the question and let you decide, but I'd like to ask uh, okay. our, uh, our, our, all of us uh, to respond to it. This came in. What do you believe is the one axiom that is most holding back scientific progress? What do you think is the most pernicious false belief that's holding us back in our creativity? I wasn't aware that we were being held back, actually. It seems to me we've made good progress. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, thank you very much, then. Um, I'd You're like to, I, I suppose, if you have anything that you'd like to say in, in summary, Professor Happer, and then our, our other panelists, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the panel. Is there anything else you'd like to, to say to our viewing audience, Dr. Happer? Uh, well, uh, I think the, the main thing I want to say is that uh, especially young people should keep their courage up. You know, uh, people often give up too soon. And so uh, if you're a young scientist or you want to be a scientist, uh, don't uh, be easily discouraged if people say you can't do it. You usually uh, are being misled. You can do it, you know, if you keep trying. Uh, um, there's this great quote from Faust, Wer immer streben sich bemüht, den können wir erlösen. You know, who, whoever keeps trying, we can, uh, we can save. And so uh, that's good advice. Uh, it was good advice then, it's still good advice today. Thank you very much. And thank you for, thank you for joining us on this panel, Dr. Happer. Thank, thank you. I'm going to sign out now if it's okay. okay. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. So yeah. um, I, I'd like to ask Megan and Ben then if you have any, uh, but there are still dozens and dozens of questions that came in. And if you asked a question and we haven't answered it, I'm sorry. There are literally dozens that we didn't get to that were sent in just for this panel. So um, given the time, I think we're going to move into our wrapping up phase. So Megan or Ben, would either of you like to... Uh, both of you is fine, but one at a time. Do you have any concluding thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience today? Uh, yeah, sure, I can say a few things. Uh, first, on your question about the axioms holding back science, um, uh, there are probably many things to name. One thing that I think is extremely important and which was addressed in part by Mr. Luminet earlier is the false belief that what we know about the universe from our own creative mental processes cannot be applied when we look at the physical world outside of our skins. Um, and I think this is an idea which really came to prominence in the 20th century. And I think that it should be eliminated because things we learn sample from our experience in classical musical composition, especially the compositions of Beethoven. These can help us investigate paradoxes having to do with time that absolutely apply to our investigation of the physical universe. So that's one thing I would put out as, as something which is extremely important. And, and I'll reference people to the work of Johannes Kepler as somebody who is exemplary as not having this problem and his discoveries certainly speak for themselves. Um, just in a final summary word uh, in terms, terms of what we presented today, I think the main message I'd like people to take is that coming out of this crisis, we must have a new paradigm, not only in economic policy and many of the things we spoke of this morning and will continue to speak of, but 
scientific collaboration must be defined by this optimistic outlook uh, for cooperation around these common aims. Humanity must be allowed to pull together and apply you know, the, the, the best talents from among us from all over the world to solve these real threats to human civilization. The only solution for which is or the only the only solution to these problems is progress, scientific leaps forward. And, and that intention really does have to guide our scientific collaboration coming out of this period of crisis. Ben, do you have anything you'd like to anything say, you'd in conclusion? say in conclusion? Uh, I, I endorse everything Megan said. Absolutely. <laughs> it sums it up very well. Um, I, you know, maybe just when, when we were discussing with Helga, Ms. Helga Zeppelarouche about the formation of this panel and, and some of the content, you know, she, she made the point that we want to just be very clear that we're having this COVID pandemic. If it wasn't COVID, it could have been a surprise asteroid, surprise comet. You know, this, this is just, uh, in a certain sense, the best thing that come out of, can come out of this crisis is taking that as a warning to get this shift we're talking about, to get nations united against these common larger threats and not go through a just tragic fate of failing to um, get beyond this a geopolitical perspective and, you know, end up going extinct like many other, as we discussed, over five billion other species have gone before, you know, it's on us to decide not to go. Um, so the best thing that can come out of this crisis is using this as a motivation to ensure that we do make the changes needed and go with LaRouche's program, as we discussed, you know, addressing not just the technical ways to avoid war, but ad ad uh, addressing the underlying causes that lead to conflict and finding the solutions in mutual shared progress that is uniquely human. That without that, you know, as Mr. Lewis spent his life defining, uh, there's no durable survival. So progress, shared progress is the guarantee of durable survival. Thank you. So I'll say something uh, in conclusion and then we will uh, move to our closing announcements. Um, as Ben just said, building on Megan, this conference takes place at a time where we have a, this COVID pandemic taking place. And it could have been any number of other disasters to which we are susceptible. That susceptibility is what we must take on. And I'd just like to say one thing about the, um, the search for enemies that unfortunately people are being pushed into right now. People are being told that China has lied about the coronavirus, that China created the coronavirus, et cetera, these kinds of things. Uh, there is no evidence that any virologist take seriously that this was a man-made virus, that it was deliberately created in China, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are also people who find fault with the performance of various governments. Um, you know, uh, Michele Geraci had mentioned how Italy could have learned more from China's experience in dealing with the coronavirus. I believe that's clearly the case in the United States. When people make the mistake, however, of looking for somebody to blame, they ignore the overall environment in which these kinds of decisions get made. And I'd like to read a, a quote from LaRouche to, to end things off here. It's from a paper that he wrote, so I can't play a video, but it's about his view of what is the real essence of tragedy. Take, uh, for example, a Shakespearean tragedy such as Hamlet. Many people learn from their literature teachers that the tragedy is in Hamlet himself, that he failed to do what he should have done. LaRouche takes a different view about where the, lo where the tragedy is located. So I'll read this paragraph from his 2000 essay entitled Politics as Art. In it, Lyndon LaRouche wrote, the principle underlying all competent composition and performance of what is known as classical tragedy is based upon the historical evidence it reflects. That principle is that in real life, offstage, entire cultures, 
excepting those destroyed by natural causes beyond man's present ability to control. These entire cultures have been usually destroyed by the fatal defects inhering within that popular culture itself, as the U.S. as a nation is being destroyed like the ancient pagan Rome of the popular arena games, destroyed by no single factor as weighty as the effect as of what is called popular entertainment today. So he says that most cultures have been destroyed by the fatal defects inhering within that popular culture. What we need to do, and which this entire conference has been addressing on the highest level, is what is a new paradigm? What is a new cultural outlook that we can adopt internationally in discussion with each other to replace the tragic one uh, in which we are susceptible to what we are currently experiencing and overcome that with a real victorious and enduringly growing future. So I'd like now to, uh, to wrap things up. I'd like to thank our speakers today, uh, Dr. Jean-Pierre Luminet, uh, Michel Tonini, Walt Cunningham, Dr. Marie Corzaga, Senator Joe Panaccio, Professor Will Happer, Dr. Guangxi Li, Dr. Kildare Clark. We're going to be starting up again tomorrow morning, if you're joining us live at 11 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. Tell your friends, if you've enjoyed the conference today, like I have, then uh, make sure to get some more people, spread the word about it to get people on for that. Before the panel that begins tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., which is going to be a panel on culture, we do have a playlist of some uh, cultural experiences for you to enjoy and learn from before that panel begins. So you'll find that on the conference website um, after uh, you'll find it on the conference website, this, this playlist. And um, with that, I'll just make one final reminder about the uh, collected works of Lyndon LaRouche, which are available you can learn more about and uh, you can purchase online at LaRoucheLegacyFoundation.org. Thank you for joining us and I hope to see you and many more people will be seeing you tomorrow for the continuation of this conference. Thank you. <laughs>